Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Welcome. I'm Mark Levine, chair of the City Council's Committee on Health, and I'm pleased today uh, that our hearing will focus on our city's animal shelter system and that we will be considering intro 401, sponsored by the great council member Paul Vallone, sitting to my left, a bill that would require a full-time animal shelter be maintained in each borough of the city. What a radical idea. Um, a little history here is in order. 20 years ago, New York City's shelter system was severely underfunded and in dire straits. In 1994, an astonishing 75% of shelter animals in the city were euthanized. Those horrific circumstances led the city council in 2000 under the leadership, if I'm not mistaken, yes. of Speaker Vallone, uh, who is watching uh, online from his office, no doubt, and under, under uh, the leadership of then Speaker uh, Peter Vallone Sr., uh, the council passed Local Law 26, the Animal Shelters and Sterilization Act, which required that a full-service animal shelter operate in each of the five boroughs. After a decade of non-compliance and many years of litigation brought by a nonprofit volunteer organization called Stray from the Heart, the Bloomberg administration and the city council came to an agreement in 2011 to repeal the five borough requirement and instead focus on improving the existing shelter system. As part of this agreement, the administration committed to increasing its investment in animal shelters by nearly 10 million over three years. This additional funding has allowed Animal Care Centers, a nonprofit which contracts with the city, to dramatically grow its staff, to increase adoptions, provide improved veterinary service, and expand rescue response and transport services. This infusion of resources has yielded dramatic results. By 2015, ACC's live release rate had increased to 80 percent. Remember, it had been about 25 percent in 1994. And uh, the rate continued to climb, now reaching this year 93 percent. It is critical that we keep this remarkable progress going. And this hearing will focus on the important question of what additional resources, programming, and staffing are needed to achieve an even higher live release rate. That is our goal. Part of the answer, no doubt, is that the city needs to finally fulfill its promise to operate a full service shelter in each of the five boroughs. DOHMH has, in fact, dedicated $98 million in its capital plan for the construction and renovation of the city's animal care centers. And uh, in January, the de Blasio administration announced the location of a new full-service animal shelter in the Baychester neighborhood of the Bronx. Progress in Queens, however, has been slower. And so far, the administration has only promised a larger admission center for the borough. The bill we will be considering today, sponsored by Councilmember Vallone, will ensure that our city once and for all live up to its commitment to open full service shelters in every borough. I look forward to our hearing today uh, with testimony from DOHMH, ACC, as well as our important advocacy community uh, as we discuss and learn about recent progress of the shelter system and what we can do to make it even better. So without further ado, I'm going to ask our committee council to administer the affirmation um, for our first panel, the administration and ACC. Do you affirm today? I, I, uh, I forgot a very, very, very important thing, which is the sponsor of today's bill um, also is going to be delivering opening remarks, so please take it away. Thank you, Chair. Um, it's an honor to sit with you today and continue this, this passionate conversation. And I thank every one of you that have taken this journey with us out there. Uh, I think from when I was grown with my mom, Tina Vallone is truly the matriarch behind this one because 
Uh, Dad wouldn't have been allowed to come home if, if this did not happen. So okay. back when, that's how passionate that was. So as we continue our journey and now we teach our children, and I understand as a new Mateo, uh, our newest ASPCA member was just born, right? So he's joining in on the group. We teach through the children and we learn, and until we see in every borough a full operating animal shelter with veterinarian care and educational facilities and doctors and staff and the ability for um, helping the folks who want to drop off, and maybe we can help them keep that pet with extra resources and help and anything we can do to keep a pet with a family or a new family is really what the goal is. We're so happy that the administration has launched in the Bronx. Um, so I had those remarks, but I think talking from the heart is always best. And I think until we see that in Queens, we will keep this going. Uh, with Chair Levine, uh, with the speaker, we had almost 40 council members in the previous term, and intro 401 is taking that same path to show that we won't stop until we see it in every borough. You know we have, our, we have your back in doing that. We wanna make sure that uh, the funding is there, that the location is found, that the receiving, um, the expanded receiving is not really where my path and heart is. So I understand the temporary status of it, but we always get nervous until we see the shelter and we hear where the site's gonna be, we're gonna keep pushing along. Um, it's beyond a balloon dream, it's really, Everyone really knows this needs to happen. It's been way too long. Uh, we have a mayor and administration and a speaker and a council that's all behind it, so now's the time. And that's why we're very excited about 401. We're very excited about the path of this. We're very excited about our chair taking today's hearing. Um, and I thank, I look forward to working with the administration and looking forward to everyone here. So let's get All right, thank you, Council Member Vallone. And now we will do the uh, affirmation. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? Take it away. Good morning, Chairperson Levine, Council Member Vallone. My name is Corinne Shipp, and I am the Deputy Commissioner for the Division of Environmental Health at the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. On behalf of Commissioner Bassett, thank you for the opportunity to testify on the department's animal shelter work. Testifying t with me today is Risa Weinstock, President and CEO of Animal Care Centers of New York City. One of the important missions of the department is to promote and protect human health by working to prevent, discover, and intervene in cases of animal-borne diseases. The scope of our veterinary public health work is broad and ranges from inspecting animal handling facilities to investigating animal nuisance complaints and monitoring wildlife and domestic animals for diseases that can impact human health. Today, I will speak specifically to our work as it relates to animal shelters. The department is charged with managing and caring <clears throat> for the city's population of owners surrendered, abandoned, homeless, and lost animals. In 1995, the city created a nonprofit entity now known as Animal Care Centers, or ACC, to operate the animal shelter system. The services that the department carries out through a contract with ACC including re include receiving and sheltering animals, providing medical services and animal placement. ACC also performs a vital public safety function by handling potentially dangerous animals, accepting suspected rabid animals for observation or preparation for testing, and working with city and state agencies in wildlife management. ACC performs these services by operating full service animal shelters in Manhattan, Brooklyn, and Staten Island, admission centers in the Bronx and Queens, and field operations throughout the city. ACC is required to accept all animals without regard to their condition, age, temperament, or adoptability. The improvements in the animal shelter system during the de Blasio administration have been dramatic. In 2015, the placement rate in the city's shelter system was 80%. Today, ACC is a national leader among municipalities with a placement rate in 2017 of over 93%. ACC's innovative programming has been recognized around the country and an invigorated independent board of directors has enabled the organization to increase private fundraising and deepen its marketing and promotion strategies. ACC has developed strong partnerships with animal welfare organizations such as the ASPCA and the Mayor's Alliance for New York City's Animals, as well as hundreds of New Hope organizations. These partners provide support every day and work closely with us just over a year ago when we mobilized a rapid and life-saving response to the cat influenza outbreak. 
I will let Ms. Weinstock speak to the impressive developments in ACC operations and will now provide details about the city's expanded capital investments. The de Blasio administration is a strong supporter of ACC. The administration has committed nearly $100 million in capital funding to support new construction or renovations in every borough, including new full-service shelters in the Bronx and Queens. In January, we were excited to announce that after a long search, the city had secured a site in the Bronx to build a new state-of-the-art animal shelter, and we are starting the public review process for that project at the end of the month. In Staten Island, a newly renovated care center will open later this year. Also in the works is the renovation of an existing garage to house a standalone adoption center in Manhattan, which will provide an expanded and welcoming space for New Yorkers looking for that just right new pet. In Brooklyn, a substantial renovation of the Brooklyn Care Center will almost double the usable square footage, improve indoor air quality, provide more room for the animals, and fill the space with natural light. And finally, the department is committed to opening a full service shelter in Queens and has been actively evaluating locations. We are hopeful that we will soon identify a suitable property. In the meantime, we will relocate the Queens Admission Center to a larger and more accessible space. The administration fully supports having a full service animal shelter in all five boroughs as demonstrated by our ongoing commitment to these projects and particularly to opening full service shelters in the Bronx and Queens. This commitment is aligned with the requirements of Introduction 401 under consideration today. We support the bill and are pleased to have the Council's strong support as we plan for those sites. The transformation at ACC has been due not only to the support of the Council, the Mayor and the Health Commissioner, but most importantly to the deep dedication and hard work of the ACC leadership and staff. I want to take just a moment to acknowledge Risa Weinstock and her management staff they are the best in their field, and on behalf of Commissioner Bassett, I want to thank them for the service to the people and animals of New York City. Thank you again for the opportunity to testify. Ms. Weinstock will testify next, and then I'll be happy to take questions. Good morning, Chairperson Levine, Council Member Ballone, and your staff, who we recognize from many tours at ACC and I thank um, Chairperson Levine for taking the time to visit a couple of our centers and getting to know our staff and actually seeing firsthand what it is to run an organization like ACC. I'm Risa Weinstock, I'm President and CEO of Animal Care Centers of New York City. I wanna thank you for the opportunity to testify at today's oversight hearing. ACC has steadily improved over the last five years thanks to the substantial support of Council and the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. I'd like to thank all of you for your commitment to the health and welfare of New York City's shelter animals. ACC is also grateful for the commitment of Mayor de Blasio toward ensuring the future success of ACC through the construction of a shelter in the Bronx and in Queens, as well as much needed renovation of our existing facilities. A little bit of background, ACC was incorporated in 1995 as a 501c3 not-for-profit organization dedicated to the health and welfare of pets and people in New York City. For over 20 years, ACC has been the city's sole contractor, charged with operating the existing municipal animal shelters and providing animal rescue and welfare services to all five boroughs, seven days a week, 24 hours a day. 20 years ago, only 25% of the animals entering the shelter system were placed. Today, ACC is a dramatically different organization. In 2017, ACC achieved an unprecedented placement rate of 93% for cats and dogs. The most significant achievements have occurred over the last five years, beginning with Local Law 59, which gradually increased our city contract budget by nearly double for staff and services enabling ACC to raise the caliber of care, programs, staff, and partnerships required for the kind of work we are contracted to do. As we improved internally, ACC began getting recognition externally from grant funding organizations and private donors, which have supplemented our budget by several million dollars annually over the last five years and has enabled ACC to add innovative programs plus staff beyond the city contract budget. Our mission is to end animal homelessness in New York City. Through targeted strategies and programs, ACC has become a leader in animal welfare and a respected model for animal sheltering nationwide. 
ACC remains committed to using the successes of the past years only as a foundation for even greater success in the future. We know that there is much work to be done, and while we're proud of the historic success, we continue to raise the bar to bring the best care to the most animals throughout New York City. By contract with the city, ACC operates under an open admissions model. This makes ACC unique among all other animal welfare organizations in New York City because we accept any animal brought to any of our five locations, whether the animal has been abandoned, surrendered, found as a stray, brought in by the public, NYPD, or our animal rescue team. And also, regardless of age, health status, breed, species, temperament, or physical condition. We operate three city-owned, full-service animal care centers located in Manhattan, Brooklyn, and Staten Island, and two admission centers located in the Bronx and in Queens. We are the only organization that accepts and seeks placement for companion animals, as well as wildlife, birds, reptiles, and farm animals. In calendar year 2017, ACC took in over 28,000 animals, or roughly 75 animals every day. I'm going to talk a little bit about our progress um, in the past years, um, starting with recruitment and hiring. Successful recruitment and retention of staff is at the core of ACC's success. Since the passage of Local Law 59, ACC has nearly doubled in size with more than 265 staff across 13 departments with a specific role as it relates to our overall mission. With over 28,000 animals in our care annually, we are keenly aware that we cannot simply end animal homelessness through adoptions alone. Staff at all levels of qualification have been added, including individuals with excellent skills in animal handling, customer service and social work, as well as advanced degrees and experience in animal welfare and not-for-profit business. ACC's core programmatic strategy focuses on reducing intake, decreasing behavioral stress and medical illness inside the shelter, increasing live placements, and building awareness of ACC's comprehensive services throughout the five boroughs. We have become a leader in animal welfare because of the innovative work we are doing inside our care centers and outside in the community. Here are just a few examples driving our success in recent years. Surrender prevention. Thousands of animals in need of care and homes continue to arrive at our shelter each year. In response, ACC sought resources beyond our contract with the city to build a department dedicated to surrender prevention. This new approach to intakes combines our passion for helping animals with our interest in the human welfare issues facing pet owners in the community. With the help of funding and training from the ASPCA, to date we have successfully helped thousands of animals remain out of the shelter by offering resources and counseling to pet owners. We will continue to seek government and private funding for this essential program so that we can help preserve the human-animal bond whenever possible and appropriate, and also help reduce shelter intake. Those who haven't been to one of our care centers in recent years would be quite surprised by the innovations ACC has embraced to increase the chances of adoptions for dogs, cats, and rabbits. Backyard playgroups play and dog walkers under the supervision of behavior and enrichment staff simulate New York City dog park environments as most New York City adopters seek social and playful dogs. Enrichment programs and improved housing for our cats and rabbits have helped them stay healthier, while trained enrichment staff have been added to help calm the animals, making them less fearful of potential adopters. With respect to community outreach, in fiscal 16, ACC introduced a pilot called the Community Pet Program, funded by the State Senator Jeffrey Klein, which works within the Bronx neighborhoods to identify dog and cat owners in need and assist them in keeping their pets. The program offers a pet food pantry, free basic obedience classes, free vaccination clinics, free spay neuter services, and has impacted nearly 1,500 animals in the Bronx last year. This program presents a very real opportunity to help New York City pet owners who struggle with pet ownership, either financially or simply, or are simply without a support network. ACC is dedicated to bringing the community pet program to all five boroughs with a goal of keeping more pets with their families. We have also grown our adoption rate and outreach work with two mobile adoption vehicles, 
For the past two years, we have deployed our mobile adoption centers each weekend to different neighborhoods for an additional 150 adoption and outreach events annually, increasing adoptions by nearly 2,500 animals since 2016. And finally, with respect to our New Hope Adoption Partners, ACC strives to provide our animals with medical care, nourishment, behavior, enrichment, and mental stimulation. Yet, thousands of animals require medical and behavioral resources beyond our capacity. This is where community partnership is vital. Our New Hope Adoption Partners provide specialized medical care and behavioral attention to animals that may otherwise not be ready or suitable for adoption to the general public or that are at risk of euthanasia due to medical or behavioral issues. In 2017, ACC added 27 organizations to our roster of over 300 partners. And finally, ACC appreciates council's consideration of council member Valone's proposal to add a full service shelter in the Bronx and in Queens. We believe the addition of these shelters will help continue to improve New York City's animal welfare system provide more services to a greater number of New York City residents seeking to adopt or in need of animal resources. It will alleviate the stress on the existing care centers that ACC operates and in the long run save more lives. In addition to building new facilities, it's essential to have adequate funding to support the many departments and staff required to run these new shelters optimally. We urge council to consider the costs associated not just with building new shelters, but with continuing to make New York City's animal sheltering system premier. I thank you for the opportunity to testify and I'm happy to take any questions. Okay, thank you Deputy Commissioner, thank you President Weinstock. Anytime we hear the magic words, we support this bill, that makes the City Council very, very happy. I uh, want to acknowledge we've been joined by Stalwart Health Committee member Keith Powers. and. Uh, I want to open by asking you to clarify the timeline on the Bronx shelter development. When can we expect that to be up and running? Uh, we are, we're in the middle of the, we're just starting the ULERT process. Let me just get there, our anticipated uh, opening date. Just give me one. So there's a ULERP required in the Bronx as well? Yes, this is la a land use process, which, we, we're, which we're beginning now. So the Euler, Euler clock has not started ticking yet on the Bronx site? It's just starting now. Got it. So then construction presumably could start in in, in a year? Let me just pull the, okay, the date so that I can answer your, your question. Just give me one moment. All right. So, sorry for the delay. So we uh, go through the Euler process and then there's a design phase and we expect to open in 2024. Wow. Um, so you're anticipating a five year uh, timeline from design to completion, which uh, uh, hardly uh, is gonna be breaking any speed records. Um, I think we'd like to look at that process and understand whether we can shave some time off that for the benefit of animals and, and companions in the Bronx. So we'd be happy to, to meet and talk about the details of, of the city's uh, land use process and design and development. And we are certainly, uh, you know, the mayor has been very clear that he is committed to opening full service shelters uh, in the Bronx and in Queens. We were, as you noted, a very, uh, we were excited in January to be able to announced that we had secured a site um, and we're um, embarking on, uh, on, on, on the land use process and the design and construction. Um, these things are, 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 are take more time than, than anyone would like, but these are, you know. Right, sort of the, can, the and can you not start design now while the Euler process plays out? Is there a legal reason you can't do that? I don't know if it's a legal reason, but th these are these are some these are steps that happen that happen sequentially. It's not a process that the Department of Health owns. Um, so we are being guided by the city's 
uh, land use process and design and construction processes. All right. Well, we should we should perhaps look at that. To me, it seems like a wasted year. If we if the money is there, it's been funded. There's no real political dispute about around this project. Uh, why not start design so that the minute we get approval of the rezoning, we can start with procurement. Seems so we like are we are surely we are working on every step that we can. Uh, should we should we bring in another uh, voice so here? We can. Do the affirmation so, um, as well if she yeah, would like sure. to speak. Yeah, sure. So uh, Julie Friesen is the deputy commissioner for administration at the health department and manages these processes and can provide the details. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee, and to respond honestly to uh, council member questions? Yes. Can you clarify this question of the timeline in the Bronx? Sure. Of course, these, as Corinne said, these things take longer than any of us would like. Um, we, we are working closely with the City Department of Design and Construction um, to tee this up, to start design. And we, we can't because, for legal reasons, um, we can't start the certificate to proceed process until ULERP is completed. We've just started ULERP. Usually that takes about seven months to go through that process. We're going to try and speed that up. As soon as ULERP is over, um, we can proceed with DDC to start the design. Okay, well, I would like to examine with you the legal sure. impediments there. It does, yep. doesn't seem like it's common sense. Um, what can you tell us about the timeline in Queens? Uh, so, the, as I noted, the mayor is very clear that um, he's committed to a full-service shelter in the Bronx and in Queens, and we've been actively uh, looking in Queens. Uh, we've evaluated about 25 properties. We came very close in two, with two potential properties. We were disappointed to lose those. Um, we're actively looking. We're hopeful that we'll have good news soon. I can't comment on a specific timeline, but we think we're getting close. This would be a property that would be suitable for a full-service shelter, or you're, this is a search for a new receiving center? No, I'm talking about a search for a full-service shelter. Um, we are also, I, and I think you noted in your opening comments, we are relocating the admission center so that in the in the interim period before we're able to open the, the full-service shelter, which as in the Bronx will be a state-of-the-art uh, full-service shelter, um, we will uh, be expanding the admission center so that we'll be able to, to increase the capacity in Queens. Has money uh, been allocated in the capital budget for construction in Queens? So we have money in the capital budget for design, and once we've identified the location and have been able to uh, determine exactly what we'll need, we'll be able to secure funding. So the 90, is it 95 million um, is to cover the entire process in the Bronx and the design phase in Queens? Is that right? Correct. Okay. Uh, do you know yet whether you'll need a ULERP at the new site in Queens? Um, that depends on the property. So, we, that's so if one it's of the not things that we look at, if it's not if it's privately owned currently, then a ULERP is required. Is that correct? Do I have that right? If it's city-owned land, we might avoid the ULERP. Julie is our ULERP uh, expert, so I'll pass. Once we identify the property in Queens, we'll, we'll know whether we'll need ULERP or not. Right. Ag again, it could be another lost year uh, if we're waiting on design uh, for ULERP. So, uh, the good thing about ULERP is um, some of this, st <laughs> it's, it's about a seven month process, but it could be shorter if all of the parties involved you know, work to expedite right. it. And that includes the community boards and so on. I've never heard anyone say the good thing about ULERP <laughs> <laughs> in any context, but, but okay. Um, I, I have myriad additional questions, but I'm going to pause and uh, allow the bill sponsor, Councilmember Vallone, uh, to ask questions. Thank you, Chair. And sure, we'll, we'll split up the time amongst our, our members. I, I guess when you hear the timeline, all the positivity that we brought into the room just kind of goes out, out the door. So if I'm hearing 2024 for the Bronx and we don't even have the site for Queens, I'm out of office, we're all out of office, I don't know who the next mayor is going to be, I don't know who the next speaker is going to be, I have concerns. I mean, I, I, this was a process that has had concerns from 2000. There was going to be another lawsuit, next mayor, there's going to be a financial crisis in the city, someone's not going to oppose the site. There's a myriad of things that can happen. 
and that's why we funded the site selection process years ago now to try to expedite this so we can you can have our support who's right here in front of you and a speaker and a mayor and we've got the group and I, I don't know what the next group's gonna be so can we not fight for the inclusion in the budget this year of funding for the Queens site we know what the Bronx site estimates gonna be we don't know the square footage we don't know the site I get that but not putting anything in the budget I don't get it. so what is our plan with actually funding the future site uh, the mayor's been clear about his commitment, and we will, we've will we been assured that when we are able to uh, determine the funding that we need, um, that we'll be able to, to secure that. I'm thinking we're in a very different place than we were um, when uh, in 2000, when your, your, you know, your, your family's uh, longstanding support um, for the shelters. Uh-oh. Um, Dad's watching. He just knocked over the thing on the thing. <laughs> um, and, and when we talk about opening, we are, there are certainly many steps along the way um, where the process will be irrevocable, so we will be breaking ground. Um, and so I think I, I'm, I'm confident in saying that, that um, this administration and the health department are working, are working actively um, toward the goal of the full service shelters in the Bronx and in Queens, and we're, we really are um, in a very different place, both with the capital projects and with all the progress that you're hearing um, from Wis Ms. Weinstock uh, about what's happening at ACC. Well, that's why we have intro 401, because even though we're all positive, we still, as a council, want to make sure that this won't be deterred by someone in the future who may not have the same positivity that we have. Um, we can only hope that folks who sit in these seats after us and the future mayor and the future speaker will have the same um, support of this, but we are plan on going forward to make sure that this is law, that we get our animal shelters in every borough. Um, and I think, as the chair said, we've got to find a way to speed this up. And I think whether it's parks, whether it's libraries, whether it's this type of project, there's, a over, there's just a frustrational element back in our communities of why things take so long. So um, can we work on like Queens is just really an unacceptable situation. I mean, this is what the Bronx is. We have a, you don't even want to look at the receiving center that we have. So what's the plan for the new temporary receiving shelter? Is it gonna just be a bigger space or are we gonna try to provide some additional services, veterinarian care, drop off care, resources? Do you wanna to speak to the, so that will be a bigger space, um, do you wanna to speak to the services that a are- A loading zone or is it just gonna actually gonna have what we what we offer at the admission center and the distinction between the admission center and the and the full service shelter the admission center is unlike a full service shelter um, formerly known as receiving centers um, we're really thinking about animal welfare differently and we don't want it to be um, publicized as this is a place it's bigger so we can take in more animals just bring us your animals so we really are shifting the way we think about animals in the community so we have a surrender prevention program and we have an admissions department and these centers are now called admission centers there is currently uh, no um, no veterinarian there we have admission admission counselors that serve pretty much like social workers and people come in if they have to surrender a pet we offer counseling to help them identify if there's an issue that will help them keep their pet and we also um, provide information on lost and found animals. Um, people may come in and we can give them guidance on adopting animals and we send them where they need to go. It's really a resource center for people either looking for pets or who need help keeping their pets or perhaps um, you know we will run our community pet program. We don't run it out of Queens right now. We run it out of the Bronx through um, um, grant funding outside of our contract, but we will expand the outreach services at the admission center in addition to taking in animals that um, that people need to surrender. So th we have to think out of the box then, because if we're talking five years in the Bronx, we're talking at least six to seven years in Queens, is there any way that we can address the situation today with our partners or bringing additional resources to the Bronx and Queens while we go through this transformation into getting on these shelters? Absolutely. So we have mobile adoption events. We, we recognize that the Queens and the Bronx are, are big boroughs and we want people to know about ACC. They want, we want people to adopt from us. We also want them to know that we are a resource for the community. We do a lot of outreach events. We actually have an adoption event coming up in Queens with one of the council members. Um, we will partner with, with council, with elected officials, with people in the neighborhood, with stores, anything that we can to get animals 
promoted and adopted through our mobile adoption and outreach events. And we will also um, provide services that, that help people. Um, you may not be able to adopt inside the Queens Admission Center, but you can get resources from us and we can set you in the right direction. Well, the enthusiasm and the support is there. I think it's, it's the next step is what do we actually bring? I remember when we came out to 169 in Bell Academy and the kids greeted you with a video on the need to have a shelter and then the mayor came out and said this is great and the kids were excited and as it promised then we had brought the mobile unit out and mm -hmm. they adopted some of the, to the parents chagrin some of them, they immediately adapted pets right on the spot. Um, <laughs> but it was, it was the process, right? And it, it, was, it was exciting and then we did it again at 1.30. Sometimes we say to you, why don't we just get more mobile units? And then it's a matter of an unfunded mandate. We can create a mobile unit, but you don't have the staff to do that. These are the type of things I think we need to do to address today and not eight years from now. I, I, I would like to, in the funding and the support from the council members, you need a mobile unit, we'll get one. I think each, yep. every council member would be happy to have C1 in there. But we want to be able to make sure you have the staff for that. Do you have the ability to create those additional places for your staff so that we can meet you on this adventure while we're getting there? A absolutely. I mean, one of the, the strongest assets that ACC has is a team of staff, leaders, management, senior leadership is here. If we have the staff, the resources for staff to um, put a mobile adoption program together in another one for Queens or whatever, as long as we have the staff, we can make the program work. We get a lot of um, capital projects and we're thrilled with the $98 million coming down the pipe for new, new full service shelters and all of the renovations. A and we, we embrace that, we're thrilled about that. But that's one show. But the here and now is what can we do today? And I agree, what, what can we do today to do better, to go beyond where we are at a 93% placement rate? Th that's, that's record breaking. But we need to add more, um, more programs, expand the programs that we're already doing to do even better than 93%. But it's not just a, a capital improvement. It has to come with the people who can staff the vehicle and select the animals. And, and we would welcome the opportunity to grow mobile adoptions. Um, it's been very successful. We have two vehicles and in the last couple of years, we've adopted more than 2,000 animals in addition to the animals that we're adopting in the brick and mortar shelters. But the fact that we, we don't see them, I, it's like once a year if I get the van, I, if I get the mobile unit. So that, that's, the momentum, the need to do these things, if it doesn't, tomorrow's emergency takes over what's happening today. And if, if we don't s take advantage of what's happening now with the kids asking for it, students want to get involved. We just had a great meeting with your staff and we talked about food uh, pantry collection that's already taking off. There's the kids in the district are like, oh, well, we'll collect things for the pets. There's such an untapped resource in our children to join us in this, but then we can't even have them with walk the dogs and the cats because it's a big responsibility. You can't have a four-year-old running off to, off to the lassie a, in the middle of that. So I think we'd be able to grow that. Do we have plans for fighting for this year's budget to increase for today's problems? That's what I want to see. I want to see the budget. I got the Bronx is funded. I got a plan, but we're not addressing what we're talking about between these next zero and seven years of how we're going to address what's happening in two of our five boroughs where we don't have a shelter. That's what I'd like to see in this year where we have a mayor and we have a council. Let's fight for the funding to do what we need, whether it's staffing, whether it's programming, whether it's resources, our partners, mobile vans and adoption centers. That's what we want to see. We want to see that, okay, we've got this for capital. We have reserve, which we don't have yet for Queens. And we have this plan in place. It can't just be that receiving shelter. It's, it's Queens is just, it's upsetting. It's beyond upsetting. This, you just can't go on in our current pace. I mean, you hear what's happening in the Bronx, that it's gonna be six, seven years. How do I go back to Queens and say, it was a great hearing today? And in, in addition to the meeting that our outreach team had with you, they're having meetings with council members in the, many more council members. One of the things about, you see the, the mobile adoption vehicle one saying you don't see it. Ironically, it's also a good thing because it, it's deployed. It's all over the city. I mean, we our shelters are not easy to but get to. have more. So it's working. Absolutely. I think it's so it's thing. working. So unfortunately, we can't just, if you pick up the phone, say, how about next weekend? We have, 
we're, we're set through the summer pretty much with events with that vehicle. It's very popular. So we do see that as and an asset. And it's a demand. I get because you have to have the, the animals. It's a demand on the animals. There's a stress level. You just can't throw them into a unit and drive them around and get pet. I, I totally get that. You know, it, it's it, both ways. You want to have a humane situation for our pets and a learning situation for the families so that there's the right. It's not the answer, but it's it just keeps that passion going to see the animals. And outreach is key. We are growing our community outreach. That is part of our strategy for the coming years, especially without a brick and mortar in Queens and in, in the Bronx. We want to get into the community to, s to make sure that we're reaching children and that people know that you can adopt from ACC where we're located, where the mobile events will be. We have um, a website that lists all the events throughout the boroughs. Outreach is really, really critical. It's the next piece of our strategic plan. Well, and I'll, I'll turn it back to Chair and the Council. I think there's, there's, an adopt, there's an ability there and then it's educational center also, even if we're not adopting out of that. A and that's where your staff has been unbelievable. There's always a little Johnny that wants to poke the cat in between the thing <laughs> and then you, you teach them the correct way on how to hold and handle a cat and an animal with love. And then that, that seed is planted in a child and a mother or father who's looking on saying, hey, maybe it is time for my family to adopt. And that's what's so important about those mobile centers, especially when you don't have a shelter is you're, you're bringing the educational and the heart right to these schools where you have now teachers and parents and PTAs and CECs who are willing to work with us. So while we have this momentum, I think we should think beyond the box and do even more on that. And I'll, I'll turn it back over to the chair. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Vallant. Councilmember Powers. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. And uh, I, this new issue is new to me, but I have to admit that uh, to the Valones, this has been going on for decades. And uh, and uh, I think you're going to have to get another Valone in the council after this to make sure that we don't uh, we don't lose sight of it. Maybe maybe I will be here. Um, I, just to follow just to follow up on the on the Queen the timing in the Queen site and and then the legal question on the ULR. I, I just want the clarification. Why I, I didn't get a the, cl the clearest answer, or maybe I missed it, what, what requires the city to be going through the land use process and complete the land use process before it is goes into the design, into, into design for the shelter? So um, we learned this through OMB, and my understanding is it's OMB Bond Council. I think it's because capital projects are, are funded by city bonds, municipal bonds. And I think um, the thinking is that ULERP should be complete so that we are 100% sure that the property is going to be developed for that particular purpose before bond money can be spent, capital money can be spent. On gotcha. So it's like an OMB mm -hmm. secure. Okay. Yeah. Um, and for Queens, you're still looking for a site. But w and what is it? What would trigger the ULERP process? It's it's is it private versus public property, or is it is it disposition of property or what's it the actual mechanism what what is the expectation around it could be site selection and it could be zoning and in and in the bronx it, what was the it was it was site selection or yes. was site selection mm -hmm. gotcha and for um I, being new to this as well i just wanted to I just wanted to clarify a couple of things the city council passed a law am i correct in 2000 that says that require that the city has to have a shelter and all a full service shelter in five boroughs. Am I correct saying that? Uh, I, I believe it was in 2000, and that was uh, in uh, the chair's uh, opening comments. I believe that it was in 2000. 2000. So then, that was local law 26 under I guess Speaker Valone, and then we've I, mean, I, I guess my I, I'll just make a comment. I mean we've passed five or six bills on this topic and are still out of compliance with it that seems that seems reckless or incredible to me and that we will be I think by the time a queen site open up 27 years from a passing of a law by the city council to have a shelter full I've, unless I'm wrong I mean you can correct me if I'm wrong in, in reading it I'm just I'm, I'm, I'm reading what's right in front of me but seems like we passed a law in 2000 four speakers ago to to uh, require a full self of shelter. So w what has been the, I guess my question is, what has been the delay or the challenge to actually comply with our own city law? I can speak for, for this administration and, and say that um, the mayor has been clear that uh, 
regardless of what is in the ad code, and there's no there's no requirement in the ad code for full service shelter at the moment. But um, we are in we've come here to um, testify in support of Introduction 401, um, and the mayor has been clear, uh, ad code requirement or no, uh, it is his uh, commitment to open a full service shelter in the Bronx and in Queens. He's made that clear. Um, to the public, and he's made that clear to uh, to us at the health department, and that is what we are actively working to do. Gotcha. And I and my colleague here uh, uh, did remind me that there was an amendment in the middle of that. So I, I uh, my my I'm still challenged by the fact that they did that. I guess, but um, but uh, but uh, I understand that. And so so the position of the administration is, regardless of whether we pass a piece of legislation or not, that the administration fully supports opening the five shelters whether we put it into the ad code or, or not, um, just, to clarify, just to put that on the record. Yes, the administration is committed to doing it. Um, we are uh, actively working on it. We are supporting the bill, um, bill or no bill. This is, uh, this is the intent, is to open a full service shelter in the Bronx and in Queens. We've announced the location in the Bronx, and we are actively working to make that happen in Queens as well. And so as uh, Councilmember Vallone mentioned some some folks will be long long past their city council tenures on to bigger greener pastures I'm sure uh, uh, perhaps I'll still be around depending on when that site gets uh, uh, identified um, what what are the steps that the city can take now we talked about budgeting maybe there's some land use uh, not 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 design but land use what are the steps the city can take now to honor I mean this is the challenge of being in in government, uh, particularly with timelines, which is that uh, sometimes we will do things that have no, we don't see the, the benefits of it, but the fear would be that your your commitment today is doesn't get honored by a next administration or the next council. So are, the, are there steps that the city can take in addition to, I guess, passing, a, I mean, I guess this would be part of passing the law, but are there other steps the city can take around, I mean, budgeting or other that to, to honor that commitment and to preserve it beyond this administration? Well, throughout the, the process, as we've been looking for uh, locations, we've certainly been open and, and encouraging council members. You may be more f uh, you know familiar with the locations in your district, um, and we, we've encouraged and, and asked for recommendations. We continue to, to welcome those. Um, when we undertake the land use process, there is a public component to that. We welcome um, your support in those in those processes. Gotcha. And the um, the middle village, I think there's a like is that that's not a that's not a full service shelter. That's a re, like a receipt. What what is happening in so, the scene? So that right that's what um, we were uh, just discussing. Oh, the sorry. new um, expanded admission center, which um, we are working to open as an interim measure while we undertake a full service shelter in Queens. Gotcha. And what, what are your needs for a shelter in Queens, like size and what are what are the needs in terms of what that's kind of community be in? Things that's like that. right. So we have a number of criteria that we use to evaluate all the sites. Um, size is critically important. Uh, you know, location, 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 right? Um, we're going to succeed in making a place where people can um, come and, and look for a, a, a new pet if we're if we're in a place uh, that's that's a right location, easily accessible. We consider the zone. The zoning for a shelter is complicated, so that's part of our evaluation. Um, the Euler question is complicated. We evaluate that. Um, we were pleased that in the Bronx we were able to identify a city-owned property. Um, that it checked off our all of the uh, criteria, so it made for an ideal site. A, a city-owned property is not a be-all and end-all, but it changes, um, makes some of the things easier for us to achieve. So there's all of these criteria, and that's why, as I said, we've we have examined something like 25 properties in Queens. We came very close on two; those fell through. You know, I think real estate is a notoriously a difficult, uh, challenging. Um, in New York City, um, but we are continuing to, we are actively looking. We have five, uh, we have capital projects in every borough. We're not working on them uh, one at a time sequentially. We are proceeding full steam ahead on all of them. Gotcha, and, and what is, what's the, compli I, what, what is the zoning complication around it? Is it what, what it's classified as? So there is a specific zoning um, category. Um, that doesn't mean that, that you know, that's something we can sometimes work with, but it's just one of the factors that we look at as we evaluate a, pro a project. Gotcha. Thank you. And the and the, I'll hand it back over. But the last question I have is the 93% rate, that other 7%, uh, 
I, I read something around it. Is it is it 18 hours? Where is that the 18 hour? Can you explain that to me? So I'm going to let uh, Ms. Weinstock address that. Excuse me. 93 percent is our placement of dogs and cats. Uh, we take over 20,000 dogs and cats in every year. With respect to that 7%, those are the animals that were euthanized. In 2017, that was less than 2,000 animals, correct? Right, outside of owner-requested euthanasia, which is a service that veterinarians provide, and we also provide it as a low-cost service to the public. With respect to those 7%, um, animals that have a health issue or a behavior issue are at risk of euthanasia. Um, keeping that um, an animal that has a contagious illness or a behavior challenge is not safe for uh, operating a full service shelter with so many animals. We, again, to remind you, we have 75 animals coming in every day. The 18 hours is an, e an additional amount of time that we give to any animal that we consider at risk of euthanasia. We publish a list of those animals for the public and for our partners to see. This is another chance for them to be placed. It is in addition to all of the efforts that our team has made to publicize the animals when they first come into the shelter. So many of them could have been in the shelter for 72 hours um, because they're stray and we're waiting to see if there is an owner, uh, if their behavior changes or their, their, um, their medical issues change, they may become at risk. And so we post this list at night. Um, it gives the public and the New Hope Partners an additional 18 hours to look for the animal, uh, to look at these animals and decide if they want to place them. Um, uh, the other thing is, uh, let me mention that um, with respect to euthanasia, another question close to this 18-hour rule. It's not, an, it's not a rule. Again, it's 18 more hours to try and get these animals out. People who say it's only 18 hours may just be getting onto the site to look at animals that are at risk. They're not, not looking at them when they first come into the organization when they are available or could be available for adoption or for placement. There is no time limit. If an animal comes in and their health and their temperament are fine, we're gonna keep that animal. Our goal is to place as many animals as possible. We want the best outcome for the most animals. We agree, let's try and place more animals. There is no time limit. We have animals, in fact, we have a dog who just left the Brooklyn shelter who has been there for months, months. There is no time limit. If they remain healthy and their behavior is, um, is safe, they will stay with us until we can make an appropriate placement. And in the interim, we're doing all kinds of programs to keep them healthy and to keep them active and um, reduce stress and all of that. But unfortunately, there are those 7% that had either an illness or a behavior issue that made them at risk. Well, what's the yeah. adoption rate once they're on that age? What's the percentage of animals that get adopted once they're on that 18 hour list? So in March, for example, posting that list um, resulted in 89% of the animals that were on that list were placed. So we see it, although it's a very um, compassion driven list to put up there and it, you know, it, it creates a lot of sensitivities. It is another avenue to try one more time, let's see if we can place these animals. Um, in the last several months, not a single cat that was on that list had been euthanized. Uh, you know, so it is just an extra. Are they, are they being adopted by individual owners? They're like people are going on that and seeing that and, and or is it, is there other organizations that take them or is it individuals? Because of the challenges that these animals have, it's either health or behavior. Um, certain animals of that 7% are only available for our um, rescue adoption partners. We call them New Hope Partners, and we have an entire New Hope team dedicated to connecting with these partners to make these placements. There are animals that have serious behavioral concerns that we would only place with a New Hope Partner because we have an obligation to ensure safety to the public as well, and we have to make certain determinations based on the information that we have of a particular animal to determine whether 
we can trust that animal in the public with, with someone from the public or if we have to only place them with a partner who we know and who we know is going to work with that animal to hopefully get them into a place um, for a better placement. Got it. And I'll just, my last question, um, what's the average stay before, what's the average, uh, you're saying, because you, you made a point that it, that it was a, was an important point to hear, which is that it's not the only, it's not only 18 hours, but it's 18 hours. All right, but what is the average time before a uh, dog or cat ends up on that eight hour or less? Again, there's no amount of time. It really depends on the individual. What's the average? Ad- the average. So our, a- our average I, I can't talk in terms of how much time before they get they are at risk of euthanasia. That's an individual determination. Our average length of stay is five days. We want to get animals out of the shelter because keeping too many animals, an overpopulation of animals drives illness. Illness drives um, stress, drives illness. Illness creates more animals at risk of euthanasia. But we don't have a specific time frame for any one animal before they're at risk. Every animal. I, I understand the point. I guess my my I, my point my the question is if the, if the if the comment which I think was received is well there is a any amount of time, and then there's a, a behavioral or a health issue that leads to putting them on the list, and that's that is the response. Maybe it's I don't maybe it's a, the right response to the question of before the end of an 18 hour list. I think I think it's a fair and reasonable question to ask what an average time is before they end up with that. Am I asking for every single animal's time? I think it's a it's a reasonable request to ask wh- how fast is that process happening on average in in practice. I don't have the information to answer that. I, I really it's not we're studying anim- animals as individuals. I can look, we can try and run some data to see, but again, I wanna go back to the 93% placement. The sooner we get animals out of the shelter, the healthier they're going to be because it's too many, to have a high population, you're going to drive more illness, which of course is gonna make that at-risk list. Um, It could make animals get on the at-risk list even sooner. So uh, we can study it and uh, I'm happy to have that conversation with you after. Okay, thank you. Did thank you have you. more information? No, I was just going to say that we'll take a look. Okay, thanks. Thank you, Councilmember Powers. I think another another way to to phrase this or to to parse the data would be to say you have a five day average for all animals before they exit. Is there a different average for those animals which are euthanized? So we'll, that, we'll that number is knowable. We'll right. We'll, we'll take a look and see if we can see if we can, we can come up with that and get back to you. Please do. Look. I do want to drill down on this 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 question of what we can do to push the live release rate even higher. I think that's that's the essential goal here. That's going to require doing more to keep animals in caring homes, in part by innovative strategies to support uh, pet owners, pet companions. You, you're doing that, but we want to do more. It's going to require um, uh, greater efforts to keep animals healthy in the shelters, perhaps by improved facilities. Um, expanded vet- veterinary care so the animals can uh, return to health or avoid sickness, uh, expanded ad- efforts to facilitate adoptions. There's, there's more we can do at every stage um, to continue the, the progress. Um, so uh, in terms of, uh, let's start with efforts to keep animals in their homes. Um, you have a uh, an innovative project, I think, in the Bronx, um, which directly serves with uh, animal owners, animal companions, uh, providing them free food, for example. It's essentially a food pantry um, for animals and perhaps offering training and other support. Could you explain how that works and to the extent in which this is a citywide program and what it would take if it's not to go citywide? That's the community pet program that you're referring to, and it is funded, um, originally it was funded through a grant from State Senator Jeffrey Klein from the Bronx to address areas of concern. Um, We saw, just looking at data, and where are pet surrenders coming from, 
um, understanding different pockets of the neighborhood. What we offer in that program, it's run out of a vehicle, not out of our admission center. And we um, have basically clinics where we offer, we promote it so people know in advance. And in fact, it's gotten so popular that before we even arrive, there are people lined up around the corner waiting for our services. We provide um, vaccines and um, appointments for spay neuter. We um, address behavior issues by offering vouchers for free basic obedience training. Uh, it's really what we're seeing is like this is, you have to think of animal sheltering differently. This is what's going on outside of the shelters. If we can reach these people and provide the services that they need, we're going to really have an impact on that live release rate because people can keep their pets longer and we see that there's a lack of services and a lack of affordable services. And with, with a Bronx shelter, you know, keeping animals out of the shelter it is terrific, but with a shelter in the Bronx and another one in Queens, we can offer a, a larger complement of these services. Right now, it's, it's in the Bronx, we have um, food pantries in, in Queens as well, but it's not, the community pet program is really more robust in the Bronx, and that's really um, because of the grant, and also it's a program that we're just trying to push to add to our complement of services. So th that program is what's the annual operating cost? The uh, annual operating cost for the neighborhood pet program, that vehicle? Well, originally, the first grant that Senator Klein gave us was $250,000. And we used that to purchase a vehicle and to hire some staff. We have a, a really good volunteer corps that helps support it. Of course, you need doctors um, and licensed individuals to, to vaccinate and to microchip. Uh, and I think, um, excuse me, let me just. So two, for each operation, it's about 200 a year. Okay, and uh, look, we could definitely use that in Manhattan. Uh, I, I think Councilmember Powers will agree. Uh, I can tell you for sure there are pet owners in my district who are on the margin and they need help. And it's just, it's such a win to keep an animal in a caring home for the animal and for the city and for ACC. So um, I feel like we need to push the envelope on allocating resources. I understand that's a budget fight, but we could use, we could use a vehicle like that um, everywhere, certainly in my district, uptown. I'm sure in Brooklyn as well, in Staten Island. So the, the food pantry is also run out of that vehicle or is that a separate operation? The food pantry is located at our admission centers and part of that, it's not just handing out food, people come in, we take their information, um, we microchip their animals and so that there's, there's a support network, it's not just you come in for free food and you leave. We're really trying to reach the, right. the individual and see what else can we, help you with and sometimes they may come in for food and we can talk them into uh, spay neuter and finding right. um, you know the ASPCA has been a tremendous partner um, to offer free spay neuter services and so there are there are surrender prevention services that we're doing in Brooklyn and in Manhattan where we will actually put someone in an uber and so or a, you know a taxi and send them to a, with a voucher to a low-cost vet clinic so whatever services we can offer, and this is grant funded, and it's really, when I, say, when I said to Council Member Vallone before about community outreach being the next major, major piece of our strategy to save more lives and um, impact animal welfare in New York City, this is part so, of it. So you have a grant to subsidize veterinary care for owners that otherwise wouldn't be able to afford that? Currently. And how, yeah. So how, how much are you allocated, how much have you received for that program? Well, that's all part of the two. This is part of. Th that's also part of this. So you're doing a lot with uh, right. that two hundred thousand or two hundred fifty thousand, right? There, there's a little more. Okay. Yeah, there's surrender prevention, which is for the veterinary care, and then the community pet program, which is you come to uh, our vehicle and we we vaccinate, um, we microchip. And so, what is the budget for surrender prevention? 
the surrender prevention budget is significant because it started as a pilot in Manhattan, in Brooklyn, excuse me, through the ASPCA, and then it was successful, and so the ASPCA helped us grow it to provide those services in Manhattan. Right. And based on what we learned, we moved it into the admission centers. And, and we can provide, I mean, it sounds like there's a different overlapping programs, and we can, uh, we can work together and provide the detail, you know, the details of this for you. Yes, and, and sur surrender prevention is in all five boroughs currently. Are you offering these kind of subsidies and transportation assistance? Yes. In all, in all five boroughs? Yes. Is there a resource limitation? Could you um, prevent more surrenders if you had more money for vouchers and, and tra cab fare, et cetera? Yeah. Right. <laughs> so. Which I, goes back to us saying, let's get the budget. It, if you feed us the numbers. I want to say that we don't want to lose sight of all of the work that's going on inside the shelter to get us where we are. And, and, I, want, and, and I acknowledge that, and I don't want to focus on that. But if we can spend a little money to keep an animal in their home, it's actually probably saving us money on net um, versus have, housing an animal in the shelter with all the staffing and, and all the veterinary care. It's, it's also better for the animal. Uh, and it precludes the, the need for euthanasia. So, so I mean, that, that, is, that is really a worthwhile investment. I think investment is the right word. And um, we need to push the envelope on the resources there. Um, it just seems like smart policy and, and, and humane policy. Um, now, one, let, let, let's, let's also focus on, on the shelter itself, where you know, I, I, I acknowledge the incredible progress that we've made. Um, and all I want to do is continue the progress, uh, which I'm sure everyone, all stakeholders want to do as well. Um, a, 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 you, you, you're battling the challenges of animals getting sick in the shelter. Um, that, I guess, is com commonly referred to as kennel cough, cough, and other ailments. Um, could you explain a little bit about why it, why it is that animals get sick and what they're getting sick from, and is it is it largely a function of close, closely confined quarters? And therefore, if we had more space, uh, could we avoid that? Disease and transmission of disease in the shelters is a factor of a lot of things. One of the um, things that we learned after the avian influenza um, outbreak was housing. We were housing way too many animals to keep disease um, down. And these are contagious illnesses. The more crowded the shelter is, the more it will spread. What we've done to really reduce disease, and through an amazing medical department under a fantastic uh, medical director um, who's been with us for a couple of years and consulted with us prior, is we looked at housing. And so we, we changed out housing to um, more space, more space for animals. And we are very aware of our cleaning protocols. We are trying to reduce stress through all kinds of enrichment programs. I mean, there's a lot of things that go into um, disease management. But the number one um, issue is putting too many animals in, in these locations. And we've managed to reduce the intake through all of the other programs that I spoke about, which really drives success for the placement rate, because fewer animals that are sick are great, be better candidates for adoption, and we'll be able to place more animals. But if you have an animal that has avian flu, a cat with avian flu, which is highly contagious, if I'm not mistaken, you put them in isolation, correct? Or are they still in the same stack of kennels that all the other animals are in? Let's not talk about avian flu because that is highly contagious. Okay. And, that's well, and that was a very uh, specific instance. That's not the common thing. But okay. So there are there are several things that we try to do. We try to treat in place. Um, it is stressful to move animals from place to place to place. Um, the isolation that we have is very limited, and um, it, it does not, uh, you know, it's not state of the art. 
uh, but to the extent we can, we have an isolation room and we isolate animals in, in a room that have highly contagious illnesses. But the best thing that we can do for those animals is to get them out of the shelter because they will impact the health of all the other animals. So again, going back to length of stay, it, it is not wise to keep an animal with a contagious illness longer until they get better. Um, it, the, the goal would be to get that animal placed and, and usually that is through one of our rescue partners but I assume you're going to have more isolation space in the Bronx shelter and hopefully in the Queen shelter, and that must be because that's a tool for preventing disease, right? Sp the spread of the disease. That's right? right. And so the goal of all of the capital projects, and when we talk about state-of-the-art projects, is designed with these best practices in mind. So the Manhattan shelter, which I don't know if we've mentioned up until now, um, I believe there's a planned expansion into the adjacent parking area. Is that correct? Will that allow us for additional isolation space? So the, um, the parking garage will be converted into an adoption center, and that will free up space and allow ACC to make changes within the uh, existing facility. And what will those changes be? <laughs> Do we not know it, yet? We really we have to look at how much space it frees up. The, the garage is going to become the adoption center. It's 2,500 square feet. It, it has a housing capacity of uh, approximately 25 animals, 25 to 30 animals. So as I said, we get 75 animals every day. We're hoping that all the adoption candidates can be in the garage, but we will really have to look at what our population is. But yes, it will free up areas. I mean, you've seen the Manhattan Shelter. We're doing adoptions. Really, we created a nook in a hallway where we have that. So, it will free up that hallway, absolutely. But the, the space where the animals are, we expect that it will definitely alleviate um, the population constraints that we have now. Okay. On the adoption front, uh, mobile vans, uh, in my experience, are very effective. We had one in my district a couple weeks ago. I know that a number of animals were adopted. It's, it's uh, so powerful to have them right where people live, where they can even casually um, stroll in. How many animals are adopted through the mobile vans? You have two, correct? How many are adopted every year? We have two, and in the last couple of years, it's been about 2,500. So, so that's a huge number. Total, in the last two years. So, and I would say about 800. I mean, each year we're doing better. So and 800 last year per was year. about 800 um, additional adoptions through the mobile event. Got it. So uh, again, we have five boroughs. So we want five shelters. <laughs> We want, uh, or we also want, we want five of everything if we can because it's a big city and um, in order to achieve our goals on the numbers, we need to be everywhere. So um, why, why don't we have five mobile vans? Money, again. So what does it take to oper operate a mobile van? You obviously it's have staffing addition, requirements. It, right. So, I, I understand. So capital um, money for a van is, is wonderful, but if we don't have, we have, have to put staff on. It's not just a driver. You have to have someone to drive it. You have to have people who do adoption counseling. So it's drivers, it's staff, it's the vehicle. The program currently runs. Well, why, don't, well, why don't we get, we'll get yeah, back to you. I, with we, have, we have the information on what each program costs, but um, the vehicle alone is over $100,000. Right. Uh, the, the capital is, is probably uh, a lesser challenge, although um, not to be disregarded. Uh, it's the ongoing staffing needs. I mean, th this, this is the heart of the matter here, which is we, we need to invest in the kind of strategies which are proven to now be working, to be preventing surrenders, to be keeping animals healthy, to be pushing the adoption rate. And uh, what, if my understanding is, is correct, we could have a virtuous cycle here because um, as we reduce intake, uh, as we can more quickly move animals out of the shelter system, um, we are going to uh, have less contagious disease. Um, we're going to have fewer animals that are left without an adoptee or a foster home. And, um, that's going, only going to drive our success rate, our live release rate higher. So um, we want to get on that virtuous cycle. And this investment, to me, seems like 
um, the way to do it and something that, that I think we need to do as quickly as possible. Um, One quick question. Go ahead, please. It, it, is there an ability to work with any of our partners now in the Queens in the Box to act as that shelter? Does any of our partners have the space, or if we were to increase the funding or the sis assistance to those partners, that could act as an interim shelter for us or an act increased instead of just a receiving? I'm not sure what you mean by partners. Well, our, our sponsors, our friends, our, the, the groups, the advocates that are working with us, does any of them have the structural or facility space that could act as a temporary shelter for us if we were to increase the funding to those groups? Maybe it's something that we can talk about. So we can think about that. Get back I, to I think that would be a, a, a good. So what are our options until we get to the point of a full working? Yeah. Uh, and I think that's what I mean by looking out of the box. Maybe there's one of the groups that will be able to give us some space to increase where maybe we just different locations of what we're already doing now. Instead of just one case in Middle Village or one on Queens Boulevard, maybe we can do the Rockaways and Story and Bayside. We might be able to increase. Thank you for that suggestion. We'll, we'll take a look at that. Okay. Thank you. Could you say a word about uh, a, a line of, of questioning I often get from the public, which is that you uh, spay and neuter an animal and then uh, are forced to euthanize it? Could you just explain the facts on that? By law, every animal that leaves ACC needs to be spayed or neutered. What we do is we spay and neuter animals that are dogs, cats, or rabbits that we um, believe will be good candidates for adoption. In the last year, with the help of the ASPCA, over 8,500 animals have been spayed before, spayed or neutered before putting them in adoption or before placement. The goal there is that it increases their chances for adoption and to leave more quickly. You come into the shelter, you want to adopt, you can take that pet home right away. Otherwise, you would have to wait one or two days, and that increases the length of stay. And again, there's constantly this formula. The longer an animal stays in the shelter, it's more stressful. Stress brings disease. In the last um, year, over 8,500 animals have been um, altered uh, spayed or neutered before adoption. It helps drive our 93% placement rate. These are animals that are ready to be placed. And um, unfortunately, as I said, there are animals that will get sick or that have behavior issues. And um, less than 1% of the animals that were altered um, last year were euthanized after they exhibited those signs they may have been all since they got they got sick after the procedure correct. correct it is not a policy because of the procedure potentially or no no not that they got an infection due to the surgery uh, no the, the surgery is you know that's uh, no uh, the, you know it's uh, we're looking at these animals if they have a health issue or if they have a behavior issue they're at risk um they're I lost my train of thought about so that. Th this <laughs> behavioral assessment is another, and there's something else I'd like you to say more about. How do you determine um, when an animal has uh, uh, basically unacceptable behavioral issues? Behavior assessment is a really complicated um, process. It, we have a lot of snapshots of animals that come into this shelter. And we, our behavior team, it's very sophisticated people who work um, with the animals who assess behavior, and they're looking at all, all signs of the animals. So it could either be through a behavior test, plus what they do in our backyards, in our play groups, how they interact with other animals, how they interact with humans. What um, You may see one snapshot, snapshot of what an animal is like um, just with humans, and it's totally different than what they're like with with um, other animals. So it's a full complement. We get information from our volunteers that work with the animals. We get information from all of our staff. They're all handling these animals, so they see them. And we put together a picture of, of their behavior, and based on that entire picture, we make decisions about what type of placement that animal should have. Um, 
A term that's often used uh, is a no-kill shelter. Could you define what that is and what that means in this context? ACC is an open admissions shelter. We are nationally recognized by major organizations across the nation. Um, in fact, today we are recognized by the Maddie's Fund um, for our excellence in leadership and in progressive programs that are saving more lives. We are saving 93%. Last year was 93%. Um, we take in 28,000 animals, 75 animals a day. What we are is a progressive organization that's putting resources and staff toward programs that reduce intake, that reduce illness, that push this high placement rate, and that reaches into the community rather than put a label on, on what we are. What we're looking at is we're a national leader that other organizations come to us and say, that, that play group program is excellent. We want to see how you do it. We've gone to LA to show how we're doing surrender prevention. We've been asked about a lot of our programs and for support um, so that other organizations can model what they do. But is it fair to say that those shelters which um, label themselves no kill have restrictions on intake? Yes. Okay. Um, we, have, we have a very long list of members of the public who want to testify. Um, which we want to move to quickly. I'll just note that there were uh, a good number of issues that you have promised us follow-up on, um, and I think many of them get to this question of how we move to the next level and what are the resources. And we talked about money, but ultimately this is a headcount question, really, for, for most of this. So to the extent you can give us a sense of the resource needs that would allow you to go to the next level, whether it's in, in capital, uh, or budget or personnel, um, we think that's really a critical question here. All right, good. Thank you very much uh, for your testimony this morning. And we're going to move to our next panel, Thank you. which uh, consists of uh, two leaders at the ASPCA. Um, uh, we have um, Matt Bershauer, sorry, mispronouncing the name, and Michelle Villa Gomez from the ASPCA. Um, and also from the Mayor's Alliance for NYC's Animals, we have uh, Jane Hoffman, sorry um, for mispronunciations. And um, due to the very, very long list of members of the public who we want to hear from, we do have a three-minute clock on this portion of the testimony. Um, Michelle, I guess Jeff had to leave, right? Okay, we, you want to kick us off? Oh. Actually, no, we, we, only, we only subject uh, members of the administration to the affirmation. We can't imagine that a member of the public would ever be untruthful. It's just, it's inconceivable. Aquí se habla español. Perfecto. Um, Paul Francais, we got you covered. Do um, you have your mic on? Yes. Okay. So thank you so much. I want to thank the council, the chair, and Councilman Vallone. And please bear with me. Um, unfortunately, our CEO had to step out. So I am going to uh, merge highlights from both pieces of testimony, and they will be in the record. Um, so we're very, very grateful to be here. This is an issue that we've been working on for so long. And as Council Member Powers brought up, this has been over 20 years in the making. And we keep having this conversation. We really do think that if you give AC and C the resources to do more, they will succeed. Um, we work with the ASPCA, uh, with the ACC, virtually with every department, and we can attest to their professionalism, their competence, and their compassion at every turn. Um, we actually provide many grants to ACC. For 2018, um, we have a grant package of $1.4 million Mar earmarked for ACNC for that pet retention program that you were talking about, transport, and something we call first alert grants, which are used to incentivize the rescues to pull the most at-risk animals, being adult cats and large breed dogs. 
ACNC has worked as an incubator, incubator for some of our pilot programs. Um, the retention program um, has been very, very successful. So in 2016, the Brooklyn pilot um, improved the welfare of nearly 300 pets. During that same period, ACNC experienced a 19% reduction in owner surrenders compared to 2015. And of the clients that were able to keep their pets, almost 90% reported that ACC's surface offerings were instrumental in helping them keep their pet. So we see that there is a direct correlation um, between pet retention and um, that animal placement rate. We're able to keep animals out of the shelter. Um, we're also able to um, provide pet owners resources to veterinary care, supplies, and resources. Um, in 2018, uh, the program launched to five boroughs so that they could use every space um, for animal intake, but also to serve as a resource center. And to date this year, ACNC has helped 115 pets through this program across the five boroughs. ACNC has also become an expert in this work, uh, even lending their experience on the national um, stage. They've provided um, advice to Florida's Miami-Dade Animal Services Agencies. Um, they provide peer-to-peer -peer education and um, it's really showing communities what's possible beyond the basic constructs of what a shelter is. So we believe that um, ACC needs funding for, yes, a shelter in the Bronx, yes, a shelter in Queens. We feel much like you were saying that um, the receiving center is a stopgap but should not be the ultimate goal. Um, we want shelters in each borough and we wanna make sure that we continue to fund, yes, capital, but also operating um, and program money because we need to be able to have ACNC um, hire the staff to be able to expand these programs and we feel that um, from our experience is that if you give ACNC the resources they really can be um, the progressive leader in humane welfare that they have been you know with that you know over 90 percent um, placement rate putting in money for these innovative programs and giving them the physical resources and facilities, um, they really can move uh, that needle forward even further. Thank you very much, Michelle. And um, we thank Matthew as well um, for your incredible work and for your testimony today. And um, we'll pass it on now to Jane. Hey, my name is Jane Hoffman. I'm the president of the Mayor's Alliance for New York City's Animals, and thank you for the opportunity, and thank you for taking this so seriously. Um, as everybody has said, Animal Care Centers has achieved a 93% live release rate, and we're delighted to have helped with that, but to emphasize the need for the money. When we created the Mayor's Alliance in 2003, our goal was to build an infrastructure for uh, supporting animal care centers and to help the organization improve outcomes for our community's thousands of homeless animals. This transformation was the focus of our strategic plan and the purpose of the $37 million Maddie's Fund grant, which you've heard about, which we secured for New York City, assisted by a multi-year, multi-million dollar grant from the ASPCA, one of the founding members of the Alliance. Nearly $30 million of that Maddie's Fund grant was funneled back directly into the hands of animal care centers and into the New York City rescue and shelter community, the rescue partners that have been referenced here. In 2005, we helped create the New Hope Department at ACC and supported the program in, a, in its infancy with a targeted grant in excess of $2 million to stress how important the creation of that was. And today, ACC has expanded that department, and it, which is the core of their life-saving program and a testament what can be achieved through the community collaboration and the increasing expertise and one, you know, greatness of ACC's operations. In 2005, we created our New Hope Pro, our, sorry, our Wheels of Hope program to provide free transport of animals seven days a week out of the ACC shelters to its partner organizations referenced here as New Hope Partners. Over the past 13 years, that Wheels of Hope has transported more than 120,000 cats, rabbits, dogs, and other kinds of animals since they have to take everything that walks up to their door. Um, we continue to support the life-saving efforts of ACC and our adoption partners and other New York City shelters and rep, uh, rescue groups by providing a vital adoption outlet multiple times each year, our Adopt-a-Palooza's mega pet adoption events, which finds homes for more than 1,000 animals annually. Animal C ACC typically adopts more than 100% of their animals that come to those events. The m mobile adoption vans are crucial to this effort. Um, and we have other partners like the ASPCA, ARF, 
by the way, that also have mobile adoption vans. These are important. It's like pets to the people. We really need to fund those. In 2012, with the enactment of Local Law 59, the Alliance and the ASPCA helped secure additional funding, again, funding for ACC, and secured an expansion of the Board of Directors of ACC to include independent voting members with a variety of backgrounds, making Animal Care Centers of New York City's board a broader mix of individuals committed to making ACC a more humane community. With regard to Intro 401, we strongly support the notion of full service shelters in all of the boroughs, thereby allowing residents to adopt a pet, locate a pet, a lost pet, surrender a pet, or access resources and services that will allow them to keep own pets in full service shelters in their homes. Um, the proposal of council that's being sponsored by Council Member Valone, thank you, uh, Brannon and Holden, um, should be passed into law, but I would emphasize once again, please do not put the burden of additional shelters on the ACC without giving them the concurrent, the funding that they need, the budget to operate these programs. Without these programs, we would not be where we are today. Thank you very much, and I think Councilman Malone has a follow-up question. Thank you, and God bless your new son that's in the world. Um, my question to the first panel and the admin was, are you aware, maybe you can help with, any partners that could act in, this, in, in, in lieu of our full animal shelters at this point in Queens and the Bronx? Is there any way that we can temporarily work with any of our partners um, to maybe handle some of that or at least expand what's happening in those two boroughs, which is basically nothing? So the ASPCA has a community engagement department, and that department works very closely with ACNC, especially on this pet retention work. So we're able to supplement that in the places where ACNC has not been able to, to reach out. So you were saying that you have in your district, uh, Chairman, you know, some people that are sort of on that brink. Um, you know, if that ACC resource is not there for them, they could always come to the ASPCA, and we're able to supplement that pet retention work with the, the vouchers for grooming, veterinary care, behavior, all of that we can do as well. Our, our hope is that eventually we get to a point where, you know, the program can live with an ACNC and ACNC can be able to, to provide that. And for that, um, you know, they do need that funding. But they have proven um, to be able to run a really effective and impactful program where they've had the funding to do that. Oh, well, we get the funding for it. I mean, that, that yeah. and that's we're not going to stop on 401 th either because at this point I can't wait for the next administration or another council, so we're, we're going full steam ahead on that. That's wonderful. Us. And then the same goes for um, spay. We were able to supplement with spay-neuter surgery, um, and in certain places we also have an adoptions vehicle, and we work with uh, ACC's adoption vehicle, so we, we may be able to, to bring pets where the people are as well. Well, that, that's where I was going. So yeah. There may be an opportunity to do some additional. Yeah, so we can, and we're concentrating some of our work, especially in the Bronx, so we find that the Bronx is a high-need community, which is why we're excited that, you know, even though it's, Mateo will be four uh, and visiting that's a Bronx shelter, but, um, mm -hmm. you know, if we can move that forward, it's great, but we're excited um, that that's one of the places where we're going to concentrate efforts. The ACNC um, ha pardon me, the ASPCA has increased their presence in the Bronx, especially in the Sonc South Bronx communities, and we're providing veterinary care, increased spay-neuter, and increased community engagement work trying to keep people and pets together. So um, we're a partner, and uh, we, we have a wonderful communica communication um, between us. So if there are needs, they can come to us, and w we should be able to help. You know, another resource which is not directly animal-related, though, is the um, food pantries, the people food pantries. If they would stock, if they could be encouraged to stock um, pet food as well, that would be somewhere, you know, I mean, there's these are wonderful programs, but they shouldn't be carrying the entire burden. I mean, these are social welfare issues. And if those human pantries would carry pet food, be encouraged, be not required perhaps, but, you know, make those available, I think that could go a long way, at least while we're trying to build up um, the resources of ACC to have additional pantries. Also, I think that the um, members, uh, the New Hope Partners and the other shelters, um, the way they're trying to support the effort is to pull as many animals as possible. Now, if there was maybe some di discretionary funding that, you know, in a person's district, a council member's district, that they could 
um, apply for. I don't think, you know, it, it, they need to pull more animals. They need to take care of them. They need to get them adopted. Um, I'm not sure they could do, and, and they do take public intake, but on a restricted basis, as you said. But I would look to the food pantries to see if something could be done there, the human food pantries. I think the chair just talked about maybe um, coming up with even an initiative Mm, the council wants to do across the districts. Wonderful. And this could be what we could target. Because I, I really believe each one of us knows the heart of our communities best and what's the schools and the teachers and the students and the groups that are that are that will do anything for our pets. And I think if we can get just even limited resources out there, we can ta start to tackle what we build. Right. We also want you a part of the creation of these shelters, too. Right. We want to make sure that the design of it is the best possible use of the square footage and all the rest of it. Because right. even when it comes to schools, you'd be surprised that Principal's like, why didn't somebody ask me that we didn't want the, this over there? And so Right. I think also there might be opportunities because of relationships that the Alliance has with the ASPCA and NACC to get donated um, goods, it, you know, simple things like we don't necessarily think of, like proper harnessing, proper collars, proper um, leashes, um, which is necessary to control behavior and that kind of thing. So I think that's a possibility, and maybe that could be available. It's a little beyond the scope of the um, food pantries, but maybe a little section for food su supplies. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, panel. We are going to move on to our next group of witnesses, which will include Deborah Thomas, Elizabeth Jason from Best Friends Animal Society, Adida Bernkrent from Nye Class, Esther Coslo from Shelter Reform Action. ahead whoever would like to start thank you very much thank you for allowing me to testify good morning and my name is Deborah Thomas I'm a longtime volunteer at the animal care centers Manhattan shelter and I've been there as a cat adoption facilitator for more than 12 years during the past 12 years I've really seen the ACC get its act together and do a complete turnaround from being an animal flop house where illness was easily spread and euthanasia rates were very high to being an ever-improving shelter where pets are well cared for and placed into homes and rescue organizations by well-trained and compassionate staff adoption counselors. These vast improvements, as has been mentioned earlier, have resulted in a 93% placement rates for dogs and cats uh, in 2017, which is a significant rise from the past years. I am thrilled to have witnessed and shared in all this progress, and I'll share a little bit of it with you now. First of all, uh, I've seen the adoption department move from the uh, first floor uh, where animals used to also be surrendered and the wait time was often up to four hours to finalize adoptions. Now it's on the second floor where welcoming knowledgeable adoption counselors can help potential adopters and they interact with the pets and they uh, counsel pets and they finalize the adoptions more quickly and efficiently. I've also seen the growth of the ACC off-site adoptions, which many times I have participated in as a volunteer, and with the help of these two ACC vans, which have been spoken of. Uh, this, as well as pro bono advertising, like the Borough Bread campaign in Times Square, public service announcements in the media, and various fundraising events and numerous rescue organization partners have contributed greatly to this improved placement rate. I've also seen the fast tracking of adoptable animals, which allow them to be spayed and neutered and pre-adopted more quickly, and that reduces their chance of getting sick and gets them out of the shelter much more quickly. We also have an ACC medical director now, which has been very beneficial to keeping healthy conditions for the animals. I can't tell you how wonderful it is to walk into the shelter now and walk into the cat room and see half the cat condos empty because the cats have either been placed or, you know, with adopters or rescues. And of course, I want to thank Risa Weinstock and the executive staff at the shelter, as well as the 
shelter staff, and the volunteers for making all this possible. I also want to thank the City Council for um, appropriating necessary funds for all these programs and hope that that will continue because as you all said, none of this can be done without the funding and we want to keep the work going and the progress uh, keep going also. Uh, I also thank you, uh, uh, Council Member Vallone for uh, Info 401 and I'm very much for that and hope it will, it will happen. I mean, I know it'll happen. I just hope it happens quickly. Uh, I just want to one, quickly one thing. I want to suggest to all animal lovers who are truly concerned about the animals at ACC, please learn the facts about the progress that's been made there. And then, uh, uh, because negative misinformation can deter potential adopters, and we don't want that. So please come and volunteer with us, and please uh, have a hand in continuing to improve the ACC. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you, Deborah. You're welcome. Okay. Thank you. Uh, my name is Adita Bernkrant, and I'm the executive director of NICLAS, an animal advocacy and political action nonprofit with supporters and activist chapters in all five boroughs of New York City, and I'm a resident of Queens. I want to thank um, Health Committee Char Ch Chair Mark Levine and the other committee members for holding this hearing on the status of New York City's animal shelter intro, animal shelter system, and the proposed intro 401. NICLAS is strongly in support of Intro 401, which would mandate full service animal shelters in all five boroughs of New York City, in which 30,000 animals come through every year. This is a campaign we at NICLAS have long been committed to, and we commend Council Member Ballone, Council Member Brannon, and Council Member Holden for taking the lead on this important issue with the legislation. We believe that the greatest city in the world deserves a world-class animal shelter system, and our supporters and volunteers in all five boroughs vehemently agree. We commend the Animal Care and Control Centers of New York City's staff and volunteers for their record high 93% placement of animals in 2017. Thanks, of course, in large part to the partnership with New Hope Animal Adoption Partner Program now in place with numerous animal rescue organizations, which has been discussed. Things are moving in the right direction for the dogs, cats, and rabbits waiting for homes, and we should build upon this positive momentum. Um, in January, the de Blasio administration committed to investing $98 million into the development and renovation of full-service shelters in each borough, announced the location of the new Bronx shelter to be built, and committed to upgrades to the existing Brooklyn shelter. However, the New Bronx shelter is not projected to be open until 2024, and there is no location for a queen shelter yet, which we have discussed at length here. And um, it should be a priority that these shelters get built and operational as quickly as possible, because as we have talked about in the hearing already, this has been going on for decades and we need solutions. We are eager to work with the city to increase pet adoptions and care throughout New York City, as well as decrease euthanasia rates. We are also committed to ensuring that New Yorkers across all five boroughs have access to the programs and services offered at city shelters. This includes facilities to receive lost, stray, or homeless dogs or cats, and field service officers who have the capacity to pick up lost, stray, homeless, or injured dogs and cats and bring them to shelters. Currently, um, both Queens and the Bronx lack full service animal shelters and the corresponding services they provide. The combined population of residents of Queens and the Bronx is about 3.6 million people, yet the residents in these boroughs only have access to animal receiving centers, meaning that they must travel to another community, which may not be feasible or financially possible, or otherwise wait for a mobile adoption truck, of which there are not enough. This means they, can also, they also cannot easily reunite with lost pets. In addition, the lack of shelters in Queens and the Bronx leads the existing full-service shelters in Manhattan, Brooklyn, and Staten Island to be overburdened as a result. These shelters are operating at capacity and therefore cannot maximize their efficiency. I'll wrap it up. Um, new full-service shelters mean better, more humane care for the cats, dogs, and rabbits in our shelters, and they will help connect more New Yorkers to loving companions. Intro 401 provides a much needed and long overdue investment and commitment to New York City's animal pet population. In our progressive, forward-thinking city, it is vital that we ensure the welfare and humane treatment of the millions of pets that call New York City home and ensure that each animal in our shelter system gets a fair shot at being adopted into a loving forever home. Thank you. I apologize, I have to step out for one moment, but you're going to be in the very capable <laughs> hands of Councilmember Vallone, who will continue to chair the meeting, and I'll be back in a moment. Thank you.
Go ahead, Eve. My name is Esther Cosmo, and I'm president of Shelter Reform Action Committee. And good morning, Chairman Levine and the other members of the committee and to Council Member Vallone. Shelter Reform Action Committee has for the past 24 years advocated for the reform of our city's animal shelter system. And the committee oversees the health department, which long resisted investing real money into animal welfare. That's why we appreciate how Mayor de Blasio, in one of his first actions as mayor, insisted the health department promise to make needed renovations to the existing shelters, as well as creating additional shelters. We also applaud Councilman Paul Vallone's bill to resurrect a law from the year 2000 requiring full service shelters in all five boroughs. And I must add that for the 11 years from 2000 to 2011, the Department of Health always used this phrase, we are actively looking for sites for the Bronx and Queens shelters. And that is a phrase that I've heard repeated here frequently today. They are actively looking. We've learned that it takes more than laws or promises to ensure that the health department does right by our city's homeless animals. For example, the um, replacement Staten Island shelter has been plagued by five years worth of delays, all of which can be laid squarely at the health department's door. The proposed site of a Bronx shelter is yet to be ulerped. The replacement Brooklyn shelter remains a promise. Um, leaving the ACC to operate in a shabby building lacking a proper roof or HVAC system. And there's been no progress on the promised Queen's shelter, just the announcement of a possible site for a replacement admission center. And where is that promised Manhattan Adoption Center? What's clear is that without constant pressure, the health department will continue to slow walk these capital projects until the end of Mr. de Blasio's term in office when they could very well evaporate. Today, the ACNC reported that it substantially reduced animal intake and its euthanasia rate. That's positive news. So why does the health department punish rather than reward the ACNC? If left to its own devices, the health department was short ACNC or needed funding. Did anyone, does anyone here know that when the ACNC, and it does sometimes run out of food for its eyes, animals, it has to turn to rescue groups to provide funding for that food, or that the ACNC has to look to rescue groups to provide basic medical equipment that every shelter should have. These monies for these core shelter needs should come from the health department, even while the ACNC has improved its fundraising. The health department contracts for the ACNC to provide a vital municipal service, and the health department should adequately pay for that service. Without proper funding in shelter buildings, the ACNC will have to continue its outsized reliance on rescue groups for its touted life-saving numbers. The city's homeless animals cannot rely on the kindness of the health department, and the committee can ensure that the health department does right by ANC, ACNC, and our city's homeless animals. In turn, the city's animal advocates will applaud and support you for your efforts. Thank you. Thank you. And if my mother knew how to actually text me, I'm sure, Deborah, she would tell you that she volunteered for 20 years oh. at ASPCA and that's, ACC. That's and wonderful. She, that was, and you can, once a volunteer, always volunteer. And Adita, thank you for always championing. And Esther, thank you for that. I, I mean, the urgency is now. It's budget season. Yep. The timing of the hearing is perfect. I mean, the bill was perfect. Mm -hmm. So please keep your advocacy going. Please keep this to the top of the list. Um, like I said, tomorrow's emergency often replaces all the goodwill and things that we wanted to do. So we want to put this into law. We want to fund it. We don't want to handcuff ACC. We want to assist them with the funding. And that's why we need that menu item list because that's what works so well with us on our side is this will get you this and this will get you this. But if we just say we can't handle it, then it doesn't get done. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. So our next panel. Um, so we have four on this panel. So from the Guardian Angels Animal Protection, you have Nancy Regula, or Regula. Uh, from SOS Save Our Shelter Animals, Zelda Penzel. For Votes for Shelter, Voices, sorry, because same thing. For Shelter Animals, um, Seaman, Cindy Seaman? Craig. Craig, Craig, you gotta work on that handwriting, Craig. My mother was a teacher, you'd be in big trouble. Um, Voices for Shelter Animals, Marilyn Galfin. 
And that's our four for this panel. And if you have testimony, make sure you hand it up. I wonder if you'd like to work down the table there. Oh, yes, we do. Yeah. Okay, turn, sorry. Go ahead. Just like Thank you. You have to turn it on? Yes. It's on. Uh, hello, I was going to say good morning. It's a good afternoon. Um, my name is Zelda Penzel. I'm co founder of SOS Save Our Shelter Animals, an animal advocacy group uh, that specializes in networking for animals in danger or at risk of being euthanized in animal shelters, not only in New York, but all around the country. And I'm here to express my support for Intro 401, the bill that would require animal shelters in the Bronx and Queens. After years and years, and I've been at this for 25 years now, of seeing so many thousands of innocent, healthy, treatable, adoptable cats and dogs killed for space. It's time for New York to be a leader and not a laggard in achieving 100% no kill in our shelter system. 95 to 99% no kill has now been achieved in many open admission shelters around the country, contrary to what we heard today. We have reached a point in our collective consciousness and awareness where we realize that it's long past time to end the killing of our beloved companion animals. Having shelters in the Bronx and Queens will do much to relieve the burden on the other three shelters. I receive and network almost daily uh, for uh, the at-risk, also known as the kill lists for AC and C. I'm happy to know that not all those animals are actually killed, but that is what it's called amongst the general population. There can be no ju justification whatsoever for killing a beautiful, adoptable animal for space. And yet we continue to do just that. Sometimes uh, we find that animals get sick and then use that as the excuse for killing when in fact it is most often an unacceptable, if not a specious argument. The Bronx and Queens have populations the size of some of the largest cities in the United States, and yet we provide no shelters for their stray and abandoned animals, no place for people to go who wish to adopt a pet, thus tacitly encouraging them to shop for an animal in a local pet store or from disre disreputable breeders online. We want people to adopt, not shop. Uh, it's time to pass this bill and move vigorously to complete the Manhattan Adoption Center, which has been also put off uh, for far too long, and updating the other shelters. It's long past time to join progressive cities across the nation that have stepped up to the plate with modern welcoming facilities for housing pets and activities that encourage and invite community members to come to their local shelter to adopt a companion animal. It's time for a paradigm that reflects animal sheltering in the true sense of the word, a place that provides protection for animals that need assistance, a place to live and not a place that condemns the innocent to death simply because they are homeless. As much as we're all on the same page, I, I have to do my teacher duty and say we use our hands, but yes, we're all clapping inside for you. Whoever's next. Okay. Hi, um, we're Voices for Shelter Animals, Craig and Welcome. I. We want to address some of the critical issues with the shelter and offer a solution. Disease is out of control. In 2016, according to the Animal Care Center of Sillimore Records, 93% of transfers were not healthy. 40% of public adoptables were not healthy. In 2017, these records were not included. In three months alone, December 2017 to February 2018, 185 dogs were at risk for CIRDC, 21 dogs were killed. On today's at-risk list, there are 12 cats and dogs. At 3 p.m. today, ACC staff will decide who lives and who dies. At the end of the day, some of these animals can be killed for a simple respiratory disease contracted in the shelter, which is easily treatable with antibiotics and is even stated on the ACC website. 
Some animals can be killed for simple behavior issues. In our opinion, we do not think the killing of these animals is humane euthanasia. ACC are using behavior assessments as part of the overall evaluation. These assessments were not made to be used for life and death decisions. Sometimes there's a very big gap between the, what the volunteer videos show, where you see a dog licking their face, eating treats out of their hands, and get great volunteer reports, but the assessment says behavior issue and pigeonholes these animals into getting new hope only ratings for such things as mouthing on their leash, hard barking, not thriving in the shelter, or scratching. If a volunteer disagrees with this asses assessment and expresses this to the shelter personnel, they are written up and in some cases dismissed. We have seen loving family animals traumatized by one entering the shelter and exhibiting fear-based behavior, resulting in new hope only status. Once labeled new hope, this limits the chances for a positive outcome. If a new hope rescue doesn't fool this animal, this animal will be killed. Once the at-risk list is published, 18 hours is not enough time to save these animals. This list is published at six, is removed the next day at noon. Interested adopters may not be able to fill out applications while at work, after work is too late. With rescue volunteers working full time, they cannot process apps and do home checks. That is not possible. Some animals have literally been killed in the middle of applications still being processed. Thank you. The, lack, the lack of promotion, especially of at-risk animals, is leading to less animals being saved. ACC is not telling interested pot potential adopters about the at-risk animals, whether they're visiting the shelter or at off-site adoption events. Animals have been left in cages, suffering for days with such things as pyometra and congestive heart failure. These are extremely painful. This is not humane. We ask the council members that these issues be made a priority. The solution to these issues and others we haven't touched upon is CAPA. The Companion Animal Protection Act, we have spoken to many of you already and are being scheduled with, some, with the rest of you. New York City can join the progressive and modern age of no kill, where adoptable treatable animal is, uh, where no adoptable treatable animal is killed unless irremediably suffering or has dangerous behavior issues. We hope the council makes this reality where each of you can be the hero for these animals. So before we start the next, I just we have the room till one o'clock, and if you just look at the papers that I have, so if we can all keep to the three, otherwise the last group will not be able to speak. And everyone in this room is on the same page, so uh, it's like the kids who don't show up to class who get yelled at. So this, we're we're all in support of this. So let's we're one big positive happy group. So go ahead. Hi, Craig Seaman, Voices for Shelter Welcome Animals. Back. What you're hearing today is what we see the numbers behind the numbers and the real firsthand experiences that us as activists go through. One of the problems in evaluating these numbers is that the health numbers on animal transfers and the health on uh, the state of the animals when they were adopted, which were in the 2016 numbers, are not in the 2017 numbers. So those have disappeared. In 2016, 37% of the animals killed were treatable. That's far cry from no kill, even though they will tout a 93%. It doesn't, it covers up the real and serious issue. issue. Part of the problems are, the, as, as you've heard, the at-risk list, 18 hours is not enough. One of the more serious problems is 501c3s that are not part of New Hope cannot pull animals. The numbers for last year and this year, which are reported, are is zero, and other public admission shelters do allow 501c3s to pull. In California, this began with the Hayden Act, passed nearly 20 years ago by uh, the late state senator Thomas, ha uh, Thomas Hayden. In New York, there was an attempt at that uh, eight or nine years ago with Oreo's law, which failed. But we can do that here in New York City to allow all 501c3s to pull. Uh, in, in this morning's New York Post, you may have seen an article that said, yes, there are roughly 300 New Hope rescues, of which they said about 55 had the capacity to pull, and only 16 were able to be contacted. And the public has the same frustration. If they see an animal that's listed as New Hope only, they have to hunt down a New Hope rescue. Yes. And it's difficult to impossible to do that in 18 hours, 18 hours in which a working person comes home from work, eats dinner, 
has a few hours, goes to sleep, gets up, goes to work. That whole period has to be extended, ideally 48 hours, to give people time to give other 501c3 time to pull. We can eliminate that 37% with that. In, in addition, uh, in addition, in contacting the rescues, they also need to contact those people who have surrendered animals because if there is an overcrowding situation, oftentimes those who surrender with the best of intention that their animal will find a home will at least temporarily pull back the animal, give them that opportunity. When they find the animal they thought was going to get rehomed, uh, it was going to get killed. The solution is the Companion Animal Protection Act. It's been passed in major cities, Austin, Reno, Portland, Oregon, Kansas City, St. Paul, Minnesota, Muncie, Indiana, the state of Delaware passed it. They all move towards no kill. It's not simply about a percentage that you hear uh, over 90%, it's a set of policies. So we're encouraging uh, the city council to go beyond the intro to build uh, five municipal shelters, but to support the Companion Animal Protection Act to ensure these animals live. Thank you. Thank you. I think we have one more. Hi, my name is Nancy Lagour, and I'm a volunteer with the Guardian Angels organization. I actually head up the program um, Animal Protection. Welcome, Nancy. Thank you. Um, I just have a, a few observations. Um, first of all, I, I think in theory, the concept of the full service shelter is great, although I think in practice, um, what's happened in New York just for so many years, it's continually, you know, sort of kicked the can down the road and uh, a lot of money is put up front for expenditures that never come to fruition. So I think the biggest issue is really oversight at this point, um, to continually keep funding animal care and control with so much money when they're showing so horrible results is, is pretty atrocious, number one. And when you look at the numbers of the euthanization that they're so um, happily touting now, that has everything to do with all of the partners that they're working with who are the people out there actually doing these things and actually yeah. doing them successfully. So there are lots of small nonprofits and individuals who already have successful models out there. And a lot of those models have to do with like, for example, what I um, do a lot of and what I've seen a lot of people do, um, going out there and actively spaying and neutering cats. There's a tremendous overpopulation issue and they're not actively doing that whatsoever. I mean, if you permit them to be an intake facility and they're not obligated to go out there and constantly spay and neuter cats, they're always going to exist. They're, they're creating this vacuum on their own just to keep staying there. Um, the idea that there's a $60 million shelter to be built in the Bronx that is only going to hold a little over 200 animals, mm -hmm. sometimes six years down the road. I mean, that's a lot of animals that are being born now and, be and dying yeah. needlessly on the street. I mean, that's, that's money that shouldn't be spent for something like that when they show that they really can't do it. I mean, $10 million was allotted two years ago specifically for finding full service locations in the Bronx and Queens. And now here we are two years later and they just found the one in the Bronx and the only thing they're discussing for Queens is doubling the size of the facility there which, which isn't full service, which actually exacerbates the problem because you're saying the more animals you have in, the, the sicker they're gonna get, the more stress they're gonna get. So you're actually increasing the chances of these animals being euthanized. So that doesn't even make any sense. And Again, th I think the idea that there are so many smaller organizations out there doing so much, they, you, it needs to be a switch made, I think, coming up really soon where you start recognizing these organizations, start funding them, and then if animal care and control remains and there's, there's some place for it, maybe it's just that they're you know, distributing the funds to these people who are doing it successfully because they really can't. That's just not their forte. I mean, even Risa Weinstock, when she was giving her testimony before, she said, Oh, we have 20,000 animals per year. It's almost 30,000. Like, I mean, for the CEO of that organization, she should know how many animals yeah. are going through. So, uh, like I said, I just think that, you know, you really need to start focusing on the people who are out there doing a great job and doing it with hardly any funding, spending their time, spending all of their effort, and really it's, it's passionate. They're passionate about it. I mean, if you take the, the bureauc bureaucrats out of it who don't have an interest, and input these people, you're going to see a, a change very quickly in New York. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you to the panel.
we can go to the next group. We have Judith Lustgarten, Roxanne Delgado, Roxanne, sorry, Diane Signorelli, and Barbara Melli, or Mealy. I like just I represent the animals. This way here. I have that. I was the post this morning. I got it. Thank you. And if we could. I won't make you cry. Yeah, I have them in my bag. Weren't there others? So two didn't. So why don't we add two people? Yeah, so let's add two people for so we can get four. How about, is Dolores Ferraro still here? No. How about Neil? I'm going to move Lois out so I can just think oh. about it. 360 West 72nd Street. <laughs> Neil, what is that last name? I'm number one. Sayer. Sayer. Why does it not look like that? I like that. All right, so Neil. So we have, all right, so let's go with this group that's here then. And William Spacey, is William mm. still out there? William, why don't you join the group? We can make four. That would be wonderful. So. Just come in. Thank you. So, go ahead. Why don't you start since you're on the uh, you're on the far side there. Good afternoon, and thank yeah. you for letting me speak before you. I've had experience where I went to adopt a German Shepherd dog named Bella, and I've had 40 years German Shepherd dog experience, and this happened in 2015. I could not believe what I went through. Temp testers. The dog was an eight-month-old beautiful shepherd. I was told that the dog was going to a man who owned an Akita. The dog was not spayed. I had I'm German Shepherd dog experience. I offered immediate adoption. I was going to take that dog to my vet in New Jersey because I was going to Puerto Rico. And I knew if the dog was sick, my doctor, who's my vet, would take care of it. If it was able to get it I immediately spayed. Greece, I had this thing going where you would pay like $250. You bring back a receipt, and then I would get my money back after I had the dog spayed. Everything was good. It doesn't work that way. It seems like they like to hold you captive. I cried. I went to all my elected officials because I know everybody. It didn't matter who I knew in the borough of Staten Island. I was so abused. Temp testers and everything. All my documentation has been documented, and I would be happy to give it to you. Fast forward. I ended up at Animal Care Control June 21st, 2015. Did you ever get Bella? No, the dog died. I have all that. They sent it. Oh, they made yeah. it go from, from me adopting it to getting kennel cough, suffer from mange. I have pictures of everything. Shipped that dog sick to an upstate rescue that was abusing me, telling me they're, I'm out of their jurisdiction. Everybody that knows me, they know what I went through. And Risa does too because I said it in front of her at the board of directors meeting. I'm on YouTube. I do not lie. I tell the truth. Fast forward. I got a beautiful dog named Sheena. Rhodesia Ridgeback, she's my German Shepherd dog. I was at Animal Care Control on my daddy's birthday, which was Father's Day, June 21st, 2015, with my friend, who's the godmother, Alice Diwali. And I, no German Shepherd dog was there, but somebody called me and said, you go back there. There's something about this dog that we needed to see. I ended up with Sheena, three-month-old, Rhodesia Ridgeback. Sheena had two strains of kennel cough. And it cost me a fortune. She's still not 100%. She's my yeah. service dog, and she is alive. And I was just grateful that I ended up leaving my food at the soul food place and running there because she just got off the, the van that was parked all day, and it was a very hot day with animal ca animals, dogs, and cats. Everybody was adopted but my Sheena, and they were bringing her back because BACC was closed. They were bringing her back to MACC, 110th Street, and I guarantee you, if I wasn't there at 4.30, because at least the manager let me adopt her, because the time frame, what they say is it's a time frame. They don't have enough of time to do my, my adoption, and they would have killed her. But because they saw I have passion in my heart, and I, I believe Jesus is, is, makes us do these things. We're poor. We don't care about anything. We care about animals. I would gladly give up a meal to give it to a stray animal on the street, and I've done it. I, and, and Jane Hoffman knows what I do with her, with ASPCA, that I do Jane has PNR. Four, three generations of volunteers. We try. We try. And I know, you know, Jane's trying to. <laughs> She's waving her hand. But we I, need, I know. But I feel your passion, but I've got it. I want to let okay. everyone just speak. Thank you, sir. And God bless for your new dog. Go ahead. Hello? And if you could start with your name, because I just want to sure, make sure. Sure, sure. My name is Roxanne. Oh, you want to go? 
No, no, I know Diane, but you're oh, Roxanne. Roxanne Delgado from the Bronx. Welcome, Roxanne. Hi, how are you? I'm not, he I'm not being paid to be here. I'm actually here because I care about the animals that li reside you. in the Bronx. Like I've been here several times throughout the decade advocating for a Bronx shelter because we are a high need, high risk area. Unfortunately, many of the population in the Bronx are, don't really know how to handle animals properly. I'm not ashamed to say that. And first, I'd like to say that I'm all for a full scale um, shelter in the Bronx, not only because we need to house only 200 animals, it's about educating, having programs to maintain the existing animals in their household. So we do need a full-scale Bronx shelter. Um, that doesn't matter how much it costs, just please put it Every there. Borough. Sooner than later. And my second issue is, unfortunately, I have been involved in the underbelly of the no-kill rescues in the Bronx. I can tell you, if anything needs oversight, it's those rescues because they self-medicate those animals, they hoard them in cages for years sometimes, um, there's always um, epidemics of ringworm outbreaks, the Kalisha virus, kennel cough, but there's no oversight of so these animals just disappear when they die in their cages. So I'm just like, I, I informed DOH in several in incidents of those, but you know, the no-kill movement is great on paper, but I live in the real world. I rather we have low euthanasia, like 99.9% .9 placement, instead of saying no-kill, because most of these no-kill people eat animals. I mean, I'm vegan, so I, I walk the talk. It's not about, it's about doing the best for the animals. It's not about the no-kill movement. So I'm saying improve the shelters, give ACNC the funding, because I think considering how little they have, they do a great job. Yes, they can improve, so could, so could everyone. I could improve myself. But if the city council also can send newsletters to advocate to adopt for animals, they could also send letters to promote adoption events, they could also help, because you have a wide range of newsletters. I get your newsletter, I get most of the city council members' newsletter, including the speaker. So. Please also, you hold a higher position. People look up to you. Advocate, lead by example, adopt a pet, and then restrict buying animals in pet shops. That's the main thing. As long as we buy animals, there will always be overpopulations. Thank you so much. You're very welcome. Just back. Make sure you get the mic. Hello, hello. And your name? My name is Judith Lusgarten. Welcome, Judith. Thank you. Uh, we need the CAPA bill passed, the Companion Animal Protection Act, which Craig spoke about. As they're doing one by one across the country, so therefore, if it can be better, and it's proven that it can, then it must. There's no other correct choice. Um, this might get a little rough, guys, so sorry. Look, look up DOH, Mario Merlino. It says veterinary and pest control. How can these two words even be in the same title? To me, it says volumes. This business needs to be spun out of the DOH and an animal welfare department created. In every successful business, I'm a businesswoman, a numbers person, and a systems person. In every successful business, you put the proper people in the proper position with a proper plan, and just as importantly, the proper motivation. ACC has attorneys, publishers, writers, their friends, and union workers. This business requires qualified business, admin, marketing, and animal professionals, and they're not in place. They tell, they tell untruths. They discredit the advocates, saying we pass on misinformation. Remember, there's two sides to every story. ACC chooses not to disclose the dark side. They don't want you to know the living nightmare the advocates live through every day into every night over and over and over again. ACC receives funding under the DOH to provide a government function. They supersede law section 1983, which infringing on the First Amendment rights by deleting comments and blocking people on their Facebook page. They're superseding the law and they're getting away with it. Risa and Matt, ASPCA, signed off in writing to Senator Avella about spay, neuter, kill. He asked about one animal. They said it was an anomaly. We've shown him a list of animals. Now they're close to 80 animals this has been done to. They lied in a January 16th meeting with the politicians saying Austin Shelter is not a no-kill. They ship animals to outside facilities where they can be killed. This is untrue, and Austin is livid. We speak with them. Humane euthanasia means only killing an animal if terminally ill with no quality of life or truly, truly a dangerous, vicious animal. ACC kills for kennel cough, which is like killing a child for a cold. Leash biting, being scared, lunging in the shelter. This isn't humane euthanasia. Animals here are treated like a disposable commodity. 
ACC has distance parameters. That's only relevant if they do home checks. They're not doing home checks. Miami doesn't have distance parameters. If, if an animal can find a safe home outside of that distance, more power, they go, but not here in New York. Ugh. Contracts, D-O-H-A-C-C, a 45-page contract that silences everyone. They're walking around like the Stepford Wives, with, all with the same verbiage. It's like the Twilight Zone. ACC, ASPCA agreement. They decide if ACC's diseased environment is acceptable after the spay and neuter surgery. They think it is. It's not. New Hope contract lists 300 rescues, only a handful pull animals. So people's precious time are wasted trying to pull off the kill list. ACC should be coordinating all this, but they're totally hands off. This is their job, for God's sakes. This is what our tax dollars are paying for, but the advocates are doing it. If the public knew, the roar would be deafening. Advocates across the country and the world are networking our animal. People in Australia, Denmark, Holland, UK, Italy, even the Italian Senator Carla Rocchi sent a video plea to de Blasio saying, you're supposed to be the greatest city in the world, but your shelters are in utter disgrace. We have a vile reputation. It's all about the moral compass and professionalism. Motivation and mindset must change. It's time for a new regime of wisdom, moral and ethical integrity and responsibility, humanity, compassion, and justice for every animal who is unfortunate point. enough to walk through I those know. disease-riddled doors. There's and a I lot have more no passion doubt. behind you. There's a lot more people with passion, too. All I right. make sure they all get a chance. It'll be the biggest you. social movement of our times, at least one of them. You know what? Please you, help you us get this right. Keep the fire going, and it's, it's a very important to have your voices heard. I mean, there's, there are elected officials... Uh, who's, who stand with you, and there are others who sometimes don't. So I think it's important to make sure spread the word. It's it's politically sometimes not easy, yeah. you know. So there's a lot of we're forces. counting on. There's you. a lot of forces on the other side too. So um, sometimes you We've find yourself alone. We've been fighting them for years. Alone, right? So it's uh, it, it's it's a struggle, and I think that's it's why I think funding it and making the law so that whoever's after me and after us <laughs> has the law because then they can't get away from it. And then I think funding it is always important. And then I think taking the passion of the volunteers that actually do it and learning is very, very important. So thank yeah, you. Yeah, we don't give out misinformation. <laughs> well, we're all trying to do it. Go ahead, sir, on your end. We didn't forget you on you. Hi, my name is Neil Shayer, and I am Welcome a volunteer at ACC with over 800 hours of volunteer time there. God and I you. foster the dogs as well. Um, ACC does have a statutory, contractual, and moral obligation to the people and animals of New York City, and ACC is falling short of meeting those obligations in some areas. Um, there's a need for more transparency, better oversight, and more funding, which would help eliminate a lot of the problems to ensure that ACNC fulfills its statutory and contractual obligations. ACC is touted all day as an open admission shelter, meaning it's never supposed to turn away stray, homeless, abandoned, sick, or injured animals. It's plain and simple. The ACC website should read, if you can't keep your pet, bring them in. To see if resources are available to help you keep your pet, send us an email. It's that simple. Compare that to the current ACC website. Readers will find that they must complete a survey, wait up to three business days for a call back, only to be given a hard sell, which is pressure to consider alternatives to surrender because their pet may wind up being euthanized at the shelter. Only after all that can a person make an appointment to surrender uh, their pet, which the appointment itself can la last 45 minutes. Mm -hmm. Over 1,500 people made an appointment to surrender their pet in 2017, but then never showed up. What happened to 1,500 animals? Okay, if ACC uh, promotes their 94 placement rate, I'd like to know what are they doing to promote the 1,500 animals that disappeared into the night? If 750 of those dogs had behavioral issues, is it really reasonable to believe that they were rehomed by the owners? Or if 500 of the appointment no-shows were warned that their cat may be euthanized if surrendered, how many people made the hard choice of just putting their cat in s outside instead of surrendering them? In fact, the percentage of stray dogs being admitted to ACC is on the rise and is now at the back up to the 214-year uh, level. Uh, sadly, there's no way to know what's happened uh, to the rabbits because of the barriers to uh, intake. Some rabbits are surely being abandoned outside, uh, while others are probably being sold on Craigslist. The other cr 
really critical point is the New Hope program at ACNC. Since more animals are placed with New Hope partners uh, than are adopted to the public, I submit that extensive oversight is needed of this program. New Hope partners must meet eligibility requirements and submit to audits and partnership status reviews. So how long should it take before someone terminates eligibility of the Crazy Goat Feed Store as a rabbit rescue group? New Hope partners are also required to provide monthly accountings of who adopted the animals that came from ACNC. So should ACNC continue to certify an organization that releases cats back onto the street as their ACC partner? If someone came into the shelter and asked to adopt a cat so they can put it back outside, I don't think that adoption would be approved. And if I can just address one of the comments about the at-risk list that was mentioned this morning uh, or mentioned before and the sick dogs, uh, ACC does not keep a permanent record of the walking history of dogs in their care. There's no way to tell one day later how many times a dog has been walked and how long that dog has been walked. And I cannot help but to believe that common sense would not dictate that if you kept a record and people knew how many times the dog was walked, that, that perhaps you can keep a few more animals healthy rather than go to the, uh, the at-risk list. Finally, I, I just want to make a point that ACC staffing and ACC volunteer departments need more money. There's more money is needed to fund the retention of good staff. There are no clear guidelines to adopting an animal out of a CNC. It is only through the experience of the, the staff and the experience is only comes with time that people and the staff can make good adoption decisions. If the turnover is high and the pay rate is low, you get people who are not as qualified to make those adoption determinations. So I would implore you to uh, provide more money for staff pay, more money for retention, and, and more money for training. I thank you for your time. I did submit something to your office via email um, yesterday uh, through Amy. Um, I don't know if you've got it, but I have extra copies here um, to give you as well. Thank you so much. Thank you, Neil, for your testimony and your input. And folks, I don't know if this was explained. We don't do applause here. You can signal your I've approval won. by. I've clearly lost control. OK, thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Our next panel, please, will consist of uh, William uh, Spacey, sorry for the mispronunciation, Janice Giacob, Barbara Melli, and Dolores Ferraro. I just want to confirm that all, all three of you I are names I just called. Is that right? Yes. Okay, so we're missing one. But um, and uh, are you William? Yes. You want to kick us off? Sure. Okay. Uh, in the interest of time, I'm going to go away because most of what I would have said has been said and very passionately. Say to uh, just one thing here. I'm looking at a, a press release that was issued in uh, January of. Uh, 2015, and it talks about the Adoption Center, and it talks about the badly needed HVAC at Brooklyn. Uh, neither of those projects are complete, and they're still both of them years away. If we're going to be embarking on the journey to the new shelters, I think we really absolutely positively must look at processes and timelines, or I probably won't be here to see that Bronx shelter open. <laughs> Thank you. None of us may be here. <laughs> we agree. Okay, and is it Janice? Okay, go ahead. Just get close to the mic, Janice. Go ahead. I don't, I don't represent any particular group, but I have congestive heart failure, and which is why I can't physically help, the, uh, which is why I can't physically help the uh, rescue services that I do financially support. But in 2006, I went up to 110th Street ACC and adopted my first dog, Charlotte. And she became my service dog, I'm sorry. And what someone up here said, they, that by law they have to have the dogs spayed, viable dogs spayed. When I picked up Charlotte, 
when I picked out Charlotte, she was not spayed. She was she was no way ready to go. When Perfectly was that? Perfectly Healthy Dog, 2006. I got Charlotte home. They when I signed the contract to get her, she was my daughter's 12th birthday gift. When I got her home. Three hours later, we had to rush her to, which is now Blue Pearl, on 15th Street and 5th Avenue. She had pneumonia as a direct result of improper care after her, her, her neutering from the, wh whoever they sent her to. I lived and, and that was also in 2006? That was in 2006, right. yes. Um, that cost me $4,000, my $100 rescue dog cost me, that was $4,000, and then she got other illnesses, which the society had nothing to do with. Then, unfortunately, she passed away two years ago, and I went back up 210th Street to save another dog, and my Sadie, she is a, uh, I had the DNA done on her. She's an American Staffordshire Terrier, full bred, back to her great-great-grandparents, and she was due to be euthanized the next day because of behavior problems. I said, I'll take her. And I brought her home, and she too was not spayed. What year was that? That was two years ago, three years ago, three years ago 2015. And she, she had no behavior problems. She's fr she lives with three other dogs. I have three other dogs in my house. They're all pit bulls. They all get along. Two were rescues from, three rescues from Memphis, and she's the rescue from, um, New York, and she's my, she's now my full-fledged service dog. I spent thousands of dollars to have her trained to be a service dog, and she, I fell the other day, hurt my wrist, and she just stayed by my side, and I don't understand how these rescue groups, like New York Bully Crew, Rescue Dogs Rock New York City, and Second Chance Rescue, and all these other places can operate and save animals, save and place animals with all people who volunteer and contributions. And, and we, as a city, can help save some more of these dogs. And our tax dollars are going to pay to put down perfectly healthy, beautiful dogs like my Sadie, who could be someone's dog that could save their lives, like this one saved mine, especially the other day when I fell. Well, thank you, Janice, for sharing uh, your story, and uh, we very much appreciate your perspective. And ma'am, are you Barbara? That I am. Okay, please. Okay, my husband and I went to the uh, ACC in Manhattan on Saturday because I didn't really want to speak of what I never experienced myself. On the good part, it was a lot cleaner than I was led to believe. I asked to see the dogs, what I call, on death row. I was told I couldn't. I asked why. They said because if I saw the dogs there, I would not be allowed to adopt a dog on the regular floor because they were all sick. Sick means kennel cough, which is very similar to a child's runny nose. There is medicine for it. If the animals were inoculated when they came in, it may curtail a lot of the problem. And then I was, because I pushed a bit, I asked, uh, I asked to see the dogs, and they asked if I had any dogs at home. And I admitted I had two. And they said, well, all these dogs are not friendly to other dogs, which I took as gospel, I tend to be naive, until I went home and I checked the dogs and I got lied to, right to my face. The dogs were not vicious to other dogs. I think one was, the rest weren't. There was one dog there that if I didn't have an insane dog at home, I would have taken home. He's got OCD, he's got a lot. He's a rescue. The dog's name is Eve. She was on the kill list yesterday, and she's back on the kill list today. There was a woman there from Staten Island who, with tears in her eyes, said, I want to adopt this dog, but they won't let me. I did some questioning. It seems when they took Eve out of her kennel, this woman's other dog, they were walking, and Eve made a motion towards the dog. 
I've had dogs since I was 11. I would have thought nothing about it. But because of emotion, that dog was refused a home and the woman was beside herself in sorrow because this dog is special and I hope she makes it through the day. Uh, there are, Manhattan is filled with dogs, we know that. Why can't some dogs be moved to other ACCs to give them a, a whole new opportunity to meet different types of people? It might not help many, but if you help one, that's one that would not have been helped. I've also, I'm trying to do this as quickly as I can, uh, I've also heard some negative things about some of the New Hope rescues. I would like them to be overseed, to have somebody look at them once every year, once every two years, make sure they are what they say they are. I have seen dogs on the list at Manhattan and also Staten Island and Queens that have tumors touching the floor, that have broken pelvises. They are given tramadol for pain, not enough. If they have vets on premises, a tumor that hangs down like this is inexcusable. I apologize. Thank you, uh, Barbara, for yes. your testimony and uh, for your activism. We very much appreciate having your voice. We're going to keep it moving only because we have more people who want to speak. Um, and uh, I believe that Dolores Ferraro is, w was not here, has already left. Okay. So we have Elizabeth Jason. Sorry. Um, okay. Thank you, Risa, for staying for the whole hearing. Much appreciated. Uh, we have Lauren Fratza. I'm so sorry from the pub from Public and Animals. Uh, Zuli Rodriguez from uh, Astoria, Queens. We have Ashley Achenbach, and finally Barbara Stewart. Barbara, who's going to hold the camera now? <laughs> You've been holding the camera the whole time. You're going to have to do a selfie. Okay. Uh, Teamwork. Uh, would you like to kick us off, please? Sure. My name is Elizabeth Jensen. I am the Northeast Regional Director for Best Friends Animal Society. Um, we are a national organization dedicated to ending the killing of dogs and cats in America's shelters. Um, and we are considered one of the leaders in the no-kill movement. And so I'll keep mindful of my three minutes, but one of the things that I just wanted to um, help illuminate is this idea of what no-kill is. And what no-kill is is um, the ending of killing of dogs and cats in shelters um, that are healthy and treatable. There's a lot of conversation about what healthy and treatable means. Um, but the 90% is a threshold. So when you look at agencies that are at a 90% um, and are very transparent with their data, it's gonna tell you a lot about that agency. In, in, in the across the country and in certain places where I'm working in the Northeast, there's agencies that are at a 40 something percent save rate. It's gonna tell you something about the programming there. But what the 90% is, um, is just a benchmark um, for you to be able to get an understanding. True no-kill is when everybody that's healthy and treatable is saved. Um, Risa is the first one to say that they've done incredible work. There's other things that they're gonna continue to work on and it is a journey and it is a process that involves the whole community. Um, but the term no-kill, um, I just wanted to clarify exactly what that means. What, when you talk about no-kill, there, um, there are commonly accepted practices that include owner adoption, uh, that include um, open adoptions, that include working with the rescue community. If you look across the country at large agencies that do very well, many, many agencies rely on the rescue community in the same way that animal care centers does. 
I'm working with Acton Philly right now. So it is, it is a common complement in a community that the rescue community is leveraged and utilized in this way um, to help support the shelters. ACC is not alone in that. Um, things like managed intake. If you do reading about successful communities, a shelter's ability to say when they have the ability to take an animal in to give it the most likelihood of a positive outcome is a common practice within no-kill shelters. And I don't want to take a lot of time here, but there, there are practices that ACC um, is absolutely implementing. We're a New Hope partner, Best Friends Polls, somewhere between 700 and probably 1,000 animals, just like a New Hope partner from, um, from ACC. Their staff has always been incredibly gracious um, and helpful um, and really um, advocating to help us help their animals. Um, and when it comes to legislation, the only thing that I caution is um, just do your due diligence because sometimes what's being professed in legislation seems at first flush like it's life-saving, but unless you understand um, the ramifications to the legislation or the cost implications of um, when you apply that legislation, sometimes, um, sometimes they can do more harm than good. I'm happy to speak with whoever wants to further about the topic, but I did want to clarify those two points. And going back to the fact that, um, for sure, animal care centers, if you look across the country at other agencies that supply these kinds of resources to a community, um, you're getting a really good value for your dollar. And I would argue um, they're probably being underpaid for the services that they do provide when you do go in to look at what they're offering. Um, so I would look at that. Thank you, Elizabeth. It You're seems welcome. the one thing everyone agrees is that we need to pay uh, yes, ACC do. staff more. Thank you. Uh, don't spend all the money yet, guys. Um, please. Hi, I'm Barbara Stewart. I represent a co coalition of animal rights activists. We uh, watch the kill list on uh, the internet, on Facebook, every night, every day. Actually, I put the animals out that are on the kill list every day. I don't get paid for it. I do it of my own free will. And are you based here in the city, Barbara? Am I? No. Where do you live? I came in out of Pennsylvania. I'm from New York. Okay. I I'm not in New York any longer, but, you know, you can take the girl out of the city, but you can never take the city out of the girl. I still have my heart here. My family's here. Um, but anyway, getting back to why I'm here, th I drove in over three and a half hours to be here so that I can speak and say how I feel. First of all, I'd like to say that uh, Risa Weinstock and Jane Hoffman should be replaced with people that are compassionate. I s I'm sitting here and I'm listening to Barbara, everyone. This is, this is not a forum for ad hominem okay. acts. You can okay. talk about policy. But okay, I will talk about policy. The policy is, first of all, there's no transparency. They're supposed to be a nonprofit, then why is there no transparency as dictated by the RARS? You're supposed to have transparency. Why is it when people s um, send FOIL letters out, they get um, vague answers and they don't answer the questions. I know people that have sent letters to FOIL requests and they come back with no answers, okay? Risa says that they're working on everything. I was watching you interview all of them from the shelter, okay? I've been here all, all morning. She scathed over a lot of the answers that you, questions that you asked her. She didn't answer a lot of them I and mean, she's the director. How come she doesn't have the answers to it? The uh, adoption center that they say they're going to make out of the garage, they got $8.5 million from capital funding. What happened to that money? What happens to all the money that they get? They keep asking you for more and more money, but yet, where's all the money going? That's what we'd like to know. I'm an advocate. I associate with all advocates. We all correspond with each other, and we see what goes on. We watch them every single day. Now, I also like, would like to know how is it da Jane Hoffman is the president of the um, Mayor's Alliance, which is not associated with the Mayor's Office, by the way. How is it that she, um, how did she infiltrate the um, New York City Animal Care Control Shelter? How does she have all her people in there running the adoption process? And how is it that rescues that are not part of New Hope can't come in and adopt unless Jane Hoffman says it's okay? How is that possible when there's so many rescues out there that would love to pull, but they can't pull because they are deterred by Hoffman's rescues? And why is it that Jane Hoffman boasts about her new HOPE program, but yet she's got over 250 uh, rescues under her 
umbrella, but only how many pull? The same handful of rescues pull all the time. Why is that? Okay, you had impeccable timing there. I, I, I want to emphasize that we can fight over the policy and the budget for ACC. We should. That's why we're here today. Um, but the people that I know who work there, including the leadership, are there because they love animals. Understand they're not, they're not in it for the money. They're not in it for the money. Uh, <laughs> they uh, they oh, are wow. uh, underpaid. Wow. And really? they are... Uh, really? They are there because they want to help animals, and yeah, okay. that doesn't prevent us from, hold on, Barbara, that doesn't prevent us from fighting over every aspect of policy, procedure, and budget. That's why we're here, but I would appreciate it, since your time is up, if the future speakers But, you know, we are taxpayers, and we're the ones paying the for all of that. Why is there no well, transparency? Well, Pennsylvania taxpayers don't pay for it. I don't care. I'm still and speaking the, for the, the shelters of, of New York do. City, and why am I kicked right. out of there every time I go there, and why do they call the police we, on me we, every we, time I go to those we, shelters? We appreciate your input, Barbara. And we're going to move to the next witness. Relax. Because they're liars. Next speaker, please. Hi, uh, my name is Ashley. Um, I'm a volunteer at a small no kill shelter in Pennsylvania. I've been a volunteer there for nine years. So I know kind of, um, obviously, it's not the size of ACC, but I know the basic goings on of the shelter. And I also help to network um, similar, um, help to network animals that are on the at risk list. And every night we see them. And every night from 6 p.m. when the list goes out until 3 p.m. the next day is just s completely frantic for the volunteers that are trying to place these animals. Um, and then when I look, there's volunteer pages that run to help network. And when I look at the volunteer pages, they have 79,000, 17,000 likes involvement from people and when I look at the ACC at risk page it has 3,000 so uh, there's a bit of a disconnect for me there as to where the networking is where the outreach is um, the second issue that I wanted to bring up and the most glaring issue to me is the consistent killing of healthy treatable adoptable animals mm -hmm. they're listed at risk mm -hmm. because of sickness that they contract at the shelter um, the behavioral issues, the behavioral assessments are often contradictory to what we see that's posted by the volunteers. Um, there's animals that have been pets their entire lives. They're good with children. They're good with other animals. And then they're dumped at the shelter, and a couple days later, I see that they were euthanized. And there's always, it, it feels somewhat like a scapegoat, an excuse as to why they, they had no choice but to put them down, and it just seems very very much like an excuse being nervous or fearful is not a behavioral issue to me that requires euthanasia i think euthanasia should be reserved for animals that are not going to get better whether it's medically or behaviorally and then i think everyone touched i don't want to reiterate so i want to just keep it concise but animals who need placement the most the seniors the ones who are cautious the ones who are sick are usually the ones who get the least amount of time 6 p.m to 3 p.m most of those hours are overnight. People don't even know that it's going on. Um, they have no time to fill out, you know, work with the rescue organizations. The spay, neuter, kill issue, um, I think that was brought up a couple times, but it was first brought to my attention with the dog, Hannah, who was stated by Ms. Weinstock that that was an anomaly, that was a rare instance. Since Hannah, there have been at least 14 more spay, neuter, kill dogs. One last week, Chloe. She was listed as you know her assessment behavioral was treatable she had some behavioral issues but she lived with children she was hand allowed handling and then she was spayed and a couple days later she was killed due to the kennel cough which you've heard is like the common cold um, I don't want to take up too much time but I just feel like I don't want to be patronized and I don't want to others to feel like they're being patronized i think mm -hmm. new york needs to do better and they need to be leading and the kappa um, bill discuss is it perfect no but it has sh proven success in other places so i think it's something that we need to look at and i think that we need to try harder all right thank you ashley and thank you for coming from pennsylvania yes pennsylvania showing up strong today hi there right. how are you <laughs> thank you for your time i'm lauren Fraza. So. i'm a businesswoman i'm a volunteer an advocate, and I'm also an animal rescue contributor. What state are you from? And a significant one. I live in New York City, Manhattan. All right. Glad to hear. So 
I recognize the complexities and layers of the animal control and welfare issue, and I think many of us do. It's a very complex issue. It's also emotionally charged and at times overwhelming, I think both for rescue organizations, advocates, and the ACC. And it's been a pleasure to hear people's perspectives. I think I'm also an eternal optimist, and I want to believe that everybody wants to do right by the animals of New York City. But I think that over, as an overarching statement, we need to encourage our council and government officials to take a look respectfully at the system because I think it's somewhat flawed or at least at minimum can be significantly improved. I don't claim to have the answers and I want to be more part, more of part of the solution, but I think we need to look under the hood a little bit more and hold the ACC and other organizations involved both accountable to um, us as taxpayers as well as a transparency to their um, rescue uh, partners, if you will, to optimize the process and operational efficiency. Um, to me, as a businesswoman, and you've said this too, I look at the math, and I don't claim to know all the numbers, right? but I've heard that there's a $17 million annual budget for the ACC, and 80% of that goes to the admin. I'm not claiming that we shouldn't get more funding. That's not right. Okay, it's not right? Thank you. Okay. So, well, I guess what I'm saying to you is, is that if you, if you break down the numbers, right, and you look at that even at a 50%, 50 percent goes to it, and I could be wrong, respectfully, that's less than half that goes to, quote, the animals and the welfare and treatment of animals. And I think if, as a businesswoman and a former partner of a firm, if my boss ever said to me, hey, you get between 50 and 70 percent, but you're not held accountable for your output and your results, I'd be fired. So I, I, don't, I don't mean to villainize the ACC because I think respectfully they've clearly made some significant uh, strong changes but I think we all collectively have to work together to make it better. The other thing I would say is it's just so disheartening as a human being. You know, we, we all get up here and we're emotionally charged to know that there's wonderful animals that are worthy of great homes and just don't, are not given the time. And I'm not even certainly suggesting that the ACC has a space issue. I, I get that. But I think that we need to improve the communications and accountability amidst partnerships, the rescue partners. And that would help us all. We'd all be better for it, but especially the animals would be. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you to this panel. And this concludes a very productive hearing. Thank you all very much. Thank you, everyone.